course not. All right, well, let's start all over again. Hey, everybody, welcome. I am Choice Minis, uh, Steve Thomas, at Choice Minis on Instagram. I just spent a whole bunch of time with my camera or with my mic muted because, uh, you know, no matter how many weeks in a row I do this, I'm just going to leave myself on mute when we start out. So um, tonight we're working on a on blonde hair for our uh, new Helmguard Dwarf Giants. Um, there's a Blood Bowl team that I'm hoping to take to uh, Army Zone Parade 2022. And you know what? The, the more time goes by, uh, the more it's looking like we might actually get on Army Zone Parade 2022, which I'm super stoked for. Uh, we are starting to hear more and more from Games Workshop about in-person events and stuff, so hopefully, uh, as time passes, we will get nearer and nearer that goal, and they will actually give us uh some actual updates on that so um as i mentioned while i was on mute our, our, our good friend yours and mine uh beach vacation mando adam grimm is off tonight uh he is recovering from having his 5g installed so uh he got the vaccine today uh we are we are both team pfizer i can report that with great delight that team pfizer is winning uh at least in our part of the world Team Pfizer is taken over, mostly because that's what we got access to. Uh, the Canadian government is actually restricted administrating or administering. Um, oh, uh, what? What? Not Moderna. Not Johnson and Johnson. Not Pfizer. AstraZeneca. There we go. Uh, yeah, they restricted AstraZeneca, so it is just a just a whole lot of. Just a whole lot of uh, Pfizer being being given out in Canada here, so that's cool. So we're going to continue to put on this base coat. I am putting it on in just like nice thin layers. Um, you know, uh, there is a certain amount of wisdom to uh, our Lord and Savior Duncan's tooth and coats. This will probably take more than two, uh, even though I am putting it over white. So uh, I can talk a little bit about how I actually base coat these models. So I base coated these models in a titanium white. And, and it is actually a titanium white. Uh, I actually um, not a huge fan of the off whites and the grays for for priming. Um, I am not a huge fan uh, of Games Workshop's uh, white primers so that I believe. See, now it's been so long since I've used it. Uh, I believe that their white primer. Well, OK, there's three of them. So there is the uh, old school white primer that they had before they did. Which I'm the Corax white. There we go. Corax white. Um, I never got good results out of Corax white. I it constantly disappointed me. It came out of the grand can gritty and lots of extra in it. I could shake it up for hours. I could heat it up all the rest. Of all the other tricks that you can use for like kind of improving the performance of rattle can uh, primers never really did it for me. Uh, it, it just never really got to the point where it was consistently coming out of the can in a way where I was willing to risk it. So uh, I, I tried, you know, this is years ago now. Uh, I used to try using it, the base coat models. And eventually I just started spraying with Chaos Black and I was like, oh, even though I have to like do way more work afterwards, Coming up from black, uh, this is significantly easier on as far as getting it out of the can in a way that doesn't just leave garbage everywhere. Uh, and then I have used Wraithbone and I have used Gracier. Those are the two newer ones, so they are more of a satin finish on them. And I, I have to say that they do spray better than Clorox White does, um, but I'm still not a fan of either of them. Um, I actually have uh, Titanium White. Uh, that I mix up with a variety of... Okay, so I use titanium white, uh, heavy body titanium white from Golden, uh, and then I mix it in with um, matte varnish. Uh, sorry, it, or sorry, not matte varnish, gloss varnish, uh, which if you take a look at the model is why it's so, so glossy. Well, at least partially why it is so, so glossy. 
I find that it bonds well, like the golden and Vallejo matte. Uh, it's not even Vallejo gloss varnish. It is Liquitex gloss varnish. Um, I find that the combination of those two things actually gets the paint to settle down quite well uh, and doesn't clog detail, even with the heavy body, the large pigments, and then I shoot it through an airbrush. Um, the great part of the... Um, excuse me. The great part of that particular rhyming step is that it does set up set me up for my second uh sort of prep step that i always do well not always but normally do on on figures that i'm trying to trying to do detail on um, i do go through with a very thin down oil wash so in the case of this guy uh it is paints gray that i go over top and then i just once once the paint spray is down on them let's, let's see if we can get... so you can see in some of the shadows and stuff it just helps to actually define shapes uh it's always harder for me to see stuff when it's just a big like monolith of color and i think anybody m most people would agree that it is hard to look at monoliths of color and sort of determine what they are so that's 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 basically my prep process now right now uh i am just painting on some Arako. so this is scale color Arako. Uh, it is one of my favorite colors in the scale color lineup. But coverage on it is pretty nice. Uh, I think it's a great sort of straw yellow color. I do also use it in some of my non-metallics, especially if I'm going for a bright silk or a bright gold. So you can see elsewhere on the model where I've done the non-metallic gold on here to about 75-80%. Um, that is that is a part of the recipe, as is Gobi Brown. So uh, I know I showed it earlier, but let's actually talk about what goes in here. So uh, our main color for this guy is going to be the Iraco. Uh, I have some Mojave white because I'm going to get to a platinum blonde. We have some white. So this is actually just scale color zero one white. And we're also using Gobi Brown. So uh, Gobi Brown or sorry, not Gobi Brown, Dubai Brown. Uh, Dubai, Dubai Brown, we are going to flood into a lot of the recesses and stuff to give us our separation in the hair strands so that we have uh, a well-realized texture on this guy because we're going to use a, mostly where we're doing highlights on the hair isn't necessarily um, it's not going to be as all over the place as, as what you see in a lot of this sort of style. Um, it's pretty I don't know, I tend to do hair slightly differently than what I see from other painters, and good thing, bad thing, I don't know, it is just a thing. Actually, I, I like the way that uh, Ninjon and, and Scott have started doing hair, and I think that that is more of a matter of uh, their process getting a little bit more refined with hair. Um, but we'll talk about that when we get there, because we will definitely get there tonight. This is one of those projects in painting, uh, hair can either go really, really well and really, really fast, or it can go really, really badly and take forever. Uh, luckily, I have painted enough dwarves in my day to know how I like painting dwarf hair, so it's it's normally a fairly, fairly quick process. We normally, even even on a model like this where I am trying to you know take some extra time, it's not normally terribly difficult. And, and this guy's got a lot of hair too, so that is always a extension of anything when you have more of it it takes a little longer to get it done to a high standard or an acceptable standard i guess so i guess i should talk a little bit um the reason why i want to take these guys to a certain standard of painting before going all the way with them so like on the demo model he is like yeah i want to say about 90 percent of the way there i took him a little further than i'm going to take sort of the rank and file models for these dudes. Uh, Want to be in focus at all? There we go. Keep them a little there. Um, lighting condition is always a thing, and because I am making these for diorama, like they are going on a board, it's just one of those things that I do want to make sure that they are situated in lighting condition that is reflective of the environment that they're standing in. 
Now, I know that that sounds stupid, and but you're going to play games with these. Yeah, I absolutely am. But then they're going to go back on their display board, and I'm going to look at that display board way more often than I'm ever going to look them on, look at them on the game board. So that's just going to be a thing. Uh, I'm pretty close here on finishing up our base coats, so just get the last couple of places here. Um, the other thing that I, I find with all paints, and this is any acrylic paint, a lot of heartache can be saved by giving uh, paint more time to dry than just letting it get too hardened on the model. So what I mean with that, there are sort of multiple stages of drying for um, or acrylic paints and and how do I how do I be there is dry to the touch right everybody everybody instinctively understands what that means like you can you can touch something and it's not going to leave paint on your hands right that is that is something we've all heard of we, we've all seen the wet paint sign um you know that sort of thing cool coolio super duper cool um beyond that sort of initial flash dry. So that is that sort of flash dry stage, that that no longer coming off on your fingers stage. There is another stage to paint drying or to acrylic paint drying that is beyond that. Um, the getting dry enough to handle is normally where a lot of painters uh, will move on with a model. We'll move on with the paint. There is a certain amount of risk associated with that, and uh, we—I think we've even seen it on stream where I've gone back to something a little bit too quickly, um, where we come back to a, a paint or a color or whatever, and it's just—it is dry to the touch. Like there is no longer liquid weeping out of it. Also. Uh, you'll notice there's gaps and stuff still on these guys. They're not actually assembled. Um, they are just like push fit together, and then I sort of left them so that I have um, something to to hold on to and something. They're just posed together more than anything, so they're just push fit right now. We will actually go through and close gaps and stuff, like the gap behind this hair there at some point. Um, that first set of step of dry. It also happens, it, it happens within, like, literally, if you're doing thin coats of paint, it can happen within seconds. Um, I happen to live in basically a desert, uh, so it does happen literally within seconds. Like, within seconds of applying the paint, it is it is dry to the touch. Um, it is not chemically dried at that point in time. It is, um, well, exactly as it sounds, it's dry to the touch. Uh, that's normally a process of evaporation. Um Acrylic paint is plastic, essentially. I think it's, it's, the medium is a plastic. I don't know how to explain that better. Uh, I probably could if I, you know, think about it for a minute, but it's basically that we're spreading bits of ac acrylic, which is a type of plastic, onto our model, right? Um, that plastic has, it, it is water soluble, but it is not, um, it is water soluble. So the solvent for that medium is water. When we add water to it, it breaks down the, the, the whatever, right? Um, just realized. I'm going to mute myself for a second. Sorry, hang on. Sorry, I had to activate a Google device, and uh, that didn't so much work as it just sat there being done. So give me one second here. I'm just gonna let background music happen happening inside of my inside of my office right now, and trying to get it to turn off.
and it still is. Okay, give me one second here. I gotta like oh I enjoy the model in the meantime. I'm certain you guys couldn't hear that on stream, but it was super, super duper annoying for me. So uh, I'm glad it's gone away. It was just loud enough that I could like, I, I could see that it wasn't getting picked up on the mics, but like it was still happening and um, it was distracting. So um, drying steps. Um, you get through the first round of drying when the water evaporates out of the medium. So the water evaporates out of the solvent. Uh, the second part of it is actually a chemical drying process that has literally nothing to do with drying and depositing. It's actually a chemical hardening process. That doesn't happen in like six seconds or whatever, right? It, it happens over a series of like hours. Um, and I know that that sounds even weirder to most people because they're like, well, the paint is essentially dry in seconds. And yeah, it is essentially dry in seconds. Uh, but full hardness on the paint takes... Um, hours and and in some case, some cases days this is sort of the same thing that people complain about with oils is oh well oils are still well no oils are activated by um get my lights to a reasonable amount of light that's too dark there we go okay um oil paints are activated by uh their solvent which is oils which is why you can touch oil paint for like two days and it's still good um, you can, and also the medium takes way longer to evaporate, like linseed oil or whatever synthetic oil they're using inside of the, the paints. It takes much, much longer for it to evaporate out of the paint and have the paint fully deposit because, uh, that is the only process for oil paints. Like oil paints don't harden like acrylic paints do. They literally just deposit all the pigment that's inside of them. Um, acrylic paint hardens with like. A chemical process that isn't just evaporation at any rate i'm belaboring this point but the fact of the matter is is that um you get two stages of hardness out of acrylic paints you get the like five second it's dry to the touch and then you get a much much longer um a much longer drying process and you can reactivate acrylic paint uh with enough water even when it's dry to the touch so like uh, you'll see me do it, you'll see other painters do it, you'll, you can try it yourself. Uh, if, if I get paint on the wrong part of the model, and I've got a good minute or two before I can't scrub it back off, just like scrubbing it with a damp brush. I mean, yeah, that's partially frictive, but like, it's not that hard to get it back off of the, off the model if I put paint in the wrong area. Um, now, I don't want to do that right now, because it could possibly damage this model. At any rate, um, that is the long and skinny of it. You really want to have wait for that second round, uh, for that second set of, of drying, to do heavier solvent-based coats over top of this. So if I'm going to add, say, like a really water-heavy wash, which is what I'm about to do with our uh, Dubai Brown here, I want to wait for a little bit before that happens. Like, I want to give it a little bit before... Um, I just go in there and drop it on there because I will rip up the old paint, even though like right now, all the paint that's on this model is dry to the touch. I can see that because I don't have this is partially why I love scale color. Everything is very, very matte. I can see that I can see in the finish that it is all very, very matte. All of the water is evaporated out of it. All the solvent is gone out of it. So I know that now it is is dry to the touch, as I say. I'm going to give it an extra like minute or two here because I want it to get beyond dry to the touch. I want it to get to actually being dry, which is like the first stage in that chemical hardened process, right? So uh, in the meantime, out on the palette, we are going to get, uh, as I was mentioning before, our Dubai brand. So I'm going to throw this onto the palette. So there's just a little tiny drip of it on there. I'm also going to grab some water and put that on the palette, and I'm just going to put that separate. So I'm just going to take a couple of brushfuls, make a nice little puddle of water on the palette for myself. Um, I'm actually also going to come in. Um, ooh, did I not put it on my desk before we started? 
Yeah, that's all right. We can, we can do it with that. I was going to say, I'm going to throw a little bit of uh, flow improver on here, but it seems like my flow improver is on my other desk. Um, you know what? No, I'm still going to do it. So, like, give me 30 seconds to listen to some chip tunes. I'm going to run to the other room and grab it. All right, we're back. Uh, so this is just Vallejo, uh, airbrush flow improver. You can use, there's golden, um, there are any variety and number of different flow improvers that are out on the market. Um, any one of those, literally any one of those could very much be what you use instead. Um, use your surfactant of choice. So what this actually is, is it is a, it, it, it literally is just a, a surfactant. So what a surfactant is, is it lowers the surface tension of whatever your solvent is uh, and, and helps to break down the surface tension in whatever it's mixed into. So in the case of like, um, well, in our case, acrylic surfactants or acrylic flow improvers, um, it could be as simple as uh, a little bit of dish soap. <laughs> Uh, it could be much more complicated than that. It kind of depends on whose it is. I just, I'm not that plus about this sort of thing. I kind of just go with whatever it is. So you can see here on the palette, uh, as I mix in a little bit of Dubai Brown into our water and surfactant mix, um, it's now very, very, very diffuse uh, as far as the pigmentation. But when I come to the model, um, and this is why I wanted to give it an extra couple of seconds to dry, other than I have a giant dunk here in my brush. Um, because I am just gonna... This is one of the rare instances where I'm gonna do a bunch of all-over washes to start with, and then we'll come back in later and do a little bit more directed shadowing. So, um, because I have a highly textured bit of the model here, I am just going in and you can see how well this covers and how well it spreads through the texture of its own volition. And that is because we put the flow improver in there, because we put a surfactant in there. So again, I've, I've heard I've heard all sorts of alternatives that you can put in here. Uh, I know that like Mark, uh, maybe it's not Mark Frizzone, it's um, 52 miniatures. Uh, he likes to put water and dish soap to do essentially the same thing that I just did without and, and it seems to work for him. Uh, I can honestly tell you, I've never tried anything other than a variety of like Golden and uh, Liquitex and Vallejo. And it just so happens that I have Vallejo uh, Flow Improver right now. So that's what I'm using. It's not, it's my favorite. I find they're all equally, equally the same. They, they do not matter that much to me. I've not had one that I would recommend over the others. I would just say that like having a surfactant around is a good idea. Now you may be asking yourself, is this how GW makes washes? Yeah, pretty much. Um, have you ever really shaken the dickens out of your uh, out of your Agrax or Shade or Seraphim Sepia and you notice that it makes a lot more bubbles than you were expecting? Yeah, that's this is why. Um, I I'm not a chemist. I can't tell you for certain that this is why, but like. doesn't take a chemist. So you'll notice now it's on there uh, and it is going to take longer to dry. Straight up. Uh, you can see that and, and that's fine on our beard. Uh, might as well keep I am prepping for fall. This concluded its first volume. So if you guys have never seen it, the series, uh, what if none of the uh, Legionis Astartes had fallen to the ruinous powers and the horse heresy and Consequently, everything that happens after that didn't happen. And now everybody is across the uh, Rubicon Primaris. So uh, we have completed chapter or volume one. And volume one was our Dark Angel. He is sitting in a different room. 
which is why my surfactant was in a different room because I was doing some some cleanup and final work. I promise as soon as I am satisfied with where he's at, I will put many photos. Many photos will go of him and his display base and his uh, fallen firstborn brother, who he is definitely in the process of about to execute. Uh, I will put those all over uh, my Instagram, and you guys can celebrate along with me that we are done. Chapter one of Project Never, or volume one rather, of Project Never Fallen. And uh, we're into volume two. And I am both happy and terrified with what we've, what I've sort of come up with for volume two. Uh, it is going to be a big deal. Uh, not like a huge deal or anything. It's just I'm taking a slightly different take. I think that most people would. Uh, imagining what happened to the Emperor's children. Not that it's like super unique or anything, but uh, yeah, we can talk about it a little bit. I I'm going to grab um, if I can get a copy of him this weekend. It's it's a little difficult just based off of uh, COVID numbers and stuff in my local area, but if I can find a copy of the model, we are going to be uh, bringing Fabius Vile across the Primaris, or Rubicon Primaris. Well, actually, he's already done it on his own. He he picked up some Primaris armor uh, in June of last year. But we are also going to be grabbing... Um, I don't know if I want to give this all away. We're going to be we're going to be working with tubs of goo. I can tell you that much. So that's something to look forward to on the channel. If you're looking for a goo stream, we will we will be doing that. I apologize if there is a lot of wind noise and stuff in the background. It is... It is becoming that, like, mid-spring season in Calgary where it is... Well, I live in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, so... You're also Canadian. Shout me out. But, um... Yeah, we're just getting into the, like, end of spring, early part of summer here where... Things are very, very hot, so I definitely had to open the uh, windows in my office so that we could get this done. So that I could continue painting without having to be covered in sweat. That would be no fun. Also, if you want to join us this weekend, we will be playing some more Forgotten Waters. I know that I streamed that a couple of weeks ago now. Uh, it was a lot of fun. We, we as a gaming group... Uh, haven't gotten to get together and play our Dungeons and Dragons campaign in more than a year. Oh, well, no, we had a brief uh, pause in the COVID lockdown in Calgary last summer where we were able to get together and play a one shot. But outside of that, we haven't actually had the opportunity to play much together uh, as far as Dungeons and Dragons. So in the absence of our Dungeons and Dragons, we've been... Uh, playing some board games and like everybody trying to keep together through uh, through playing games on Zoom and whatnot. So <laughs> Zoom and Discord. And of course, if you want to join us on our Discord, uh, you can follow the links in the bio. Uh, just our Willow Tree link will get you to the Discord. And uh, might be looking for more people to play. So if you want to come and play with us, uh, that's totally cool. We'd love to have you along with our merry band of pirates or some forgotten waters. I really do love the game. Just I like pirates and uh, so far it seems like a pretty fun pirate game. So it's good. That is good. Okay, we are just about done drying up the beard. You can see there's still the last couple of places just in and around the very deep recesses that we're, we're waiting for it to dry. Um, I want it to be pretty thoroughly dried there. Uh, now, we aren't going to wait for it to flash to the second mode of drying because uh, the next step is we're going to be dropping shadow into more specified places. So as we get... Because I'm dropping shadow into recesses, I'm not overly concerned about it ripping up because it's not a flat surface. It's not high on the model. It's not high visibility or anything. So even though I spent like 20 minutes talking about uh, how... You should let paint dry properly and don't get overly zealous. And I definitely am speaking from experience on that one. Definitely, definitely. 100%. Uh, 
telling you this because of stuff I did to myself this weekend while I was trying to paint models. Actually, we can talk about those little dudes here in a second too, because finish. Uh, obviously, not every brush stroke is going to end up on stream, but you know, when I can, I like to keep hanging out with you guys on stream and doing this. So. <clears throat> All right, so uh, this is just pink flesh, by the way. Uh, scale color, pink flesh. So scale color, what? 21? Scale color, 21. Pink flesh. I don't know. There we go. You can see it now. So I put my order in for my new camera before I went live the first time. Right now, I am very graciously using my roommate's camera. She has just been fantastic about letting me use it. So uh, I can't thank you enough, V. But boy, howdy. Once that camera shows up, there are like eight lenses that I have just hanging out in carts <laughs> in a variety of camera websites. And whoever can get it to me first is going to get me a new camera because the autofocus on this is just a little slow for what we want it to be here. And the lens is a little short for what we want to do. So, I mean, again, not, not knocking B. I love, I love you and thank you for letting me use your camera. But, uh, yeah. I'm going to drop a little bit more of this pink flesh or pink skin, I believe it's called, into the eye sockets of the helm. I will come back and clean those up later just because they're going to need it and see if we can get them to focus up come on camera focus up so this is where we're at none of it is particularly well finished but that's fine that's that's what we're looking for right now we are looking for you know 70 60 to 70 percent done on the the non-metallic gold in the armor uh, and we're going to get the hair to probably a little bit beyond that but not much We'll get it to about 65, 70, maybe 80% of the way to done. Uh, and then we'll have to keep working on it. So a couple of things I want to do with this model. Um, first off, we still on our palette. So right here, we still have that surfactant and water mix. I'm going to take some of that. I'm going to take some of our, uh, this is Dubai Brown. So this is a nice warm brown, warm red brown. Uh, and we're looking for about that sort of consistency. So uh, if it will come into focus, there we go. So that's about the consistency that we're looking for. So it is still thin, um, but it's not like transparent or anything. And now we're going to start defining volumes on this stuff, right? So on the lower, on the shaded sides of this big old cylinder, just going to drop in some paint. And drop in the same way on the shadowed side of these braids. We're also going to do the same thing. So, and then on the lower sides of the individual braids, going this way, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to come in, make some separation happen here. And the reason why we use the surfactant again, as opposed to just mixing this with water, is because I do want it to drop down lower into the hair fibers, right? So we want it to drop into the corners. We want it to drop into the recesses. Just like we expect a shade to. This is basically making a homemade shade, but rather than like last time where we just dropped it sort of all over, now we're starting to be more and more careful about where exactly that color ends up. So, and it is a little bit stronger than the last time we dropped it on the model. So like we are both being more precise with where it ends up on the model, as well as having a little bit more power to it. In that first go round, what we were really trying to get set up with was just big volumes, big shapes, um, and even just toning the color entirely towards a warmer sort of gold. As you can tell, uh, or you may not be able to, I'm blonde as well. Uh, I was platinum blonde as a kid. I am less platinum blonde now. Uh, just. Time has aged my hair and genetics has uh, pulled it back from that ridiculous, like I had, I, 
it, I can't even really truthfully say platinum blonde. I had white hair as a kid. And not like old man white hair, like grayish white hair. I had like straight up white hair uh, until I basically hit puberty. Um, that is not how most people have blonde hair. Uh, it is not uncommon, of course. Uh, there are plenty of people of the same descent that I have, like genetic history that I have, at, that have a similar sort of hair color uh, at similar ages. But I can tell you that most blonde hair that isn't dyed blonde, it tends towards brown as you get later in life, because that's just how blonde hair be. Um, knowing that, we can introduce this sort of reddish brown into the low lights of the hair, and also just sort of tinting the hair overall. Like this is this is definitely an overall still color shift that I find uh, just a rock one itself is a little bit too far towards the yellow side of things. It's a not too saturated so much as just a little too far towards yellow for my for my choice. And since, you know, in a lot of cases, dwarves are some sort of shorthand for like Norse, Norwegian, um, Scandinavian descent, mostly because that's like the cultural history of them, like that is from a mythological standpoint, uh, dwarves were like an invention of like the Germanic tribes. So like, not the Germanic tribes, of the Norse peoples. Uh, and then of the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, the, the um, Viking di diaspora, like the, sorry, the uh, Scandinavian diaspora. So like, as they moved across the planet, their stuff, their, their myths and tales came with them, of course. Uh, as 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 it normally does, as as tales normally do, they travel with the people who tell them. Weird, right? Uh, but anyway, the so dwarves are normally you know some form of like, if not absolutely Vikings, like some sort of like Nor Nordic stand-in is generally how they're portrayed. So um, having a lot of that ancestry, uh, I can tell you what the hair color does. <laughs> See it in a lot of my. Uh, Older relatives and younger relatives. Not saying that there aren't other uh, blonde uh, heritages out there, but like. It is definitely one of the more popular ones as far as like. Prevalence goes like I, I, I don't know, I just a lot of people who don't dye their hair blonde assume that like dyed blonde hair is the color of blonde hair and it certainly is not like as people age that hair color changes dyed blonde hair is a dead giveaway that's <laughs> it doesn't change color naturally it just stays blonde forever which isn't a thing any anyway, rate enough about me ranting about how uh blonde hair is i don't even know if i'm ranting about its portrayal it's just it's weird that people uh think that that like weird straw yellow blonde is a, a hair color okay so you guys can see we started to get some richness into the model now uh, again i'm gonna have to leave it here for a few seconds to to well for a minute or so here to dry so that we can sort of start building the color back up because uh, we do want to put highlights into this hair. We don't want to leave it just this, even though it is like an inviting color. Uh, I do want to get this looking like sandy blonde hair. And part of that is building up our highlights using the highlight colors that we've selected. I'm just going to quickly continue to make the shadows on this guy work. So uh, even though I'm not introducing a universal shadow color on this part of the model, and this is because uh, blonde hair doesn't take kindly to the universal shadow color that we've decided on for this guy. So the universal shadow color is a little bit of a, or sorry, it is abyssal blue. Um, now the universal shadow color, obviously, uh, gonna make things a little bit more difficult, and it doesn't work at all. In it, it turns into like weird green shadows because of the way that. Uh, the pigment in the abyssal blue works. Trust me, I've tried this already on a model. It doesn't look like. Uh, we're using a universal shadow color. It looks like I 
decided that he has garbage in his beard because it's just like weird green color mix. Yep. Okay. Now, I, I don't have a buddy to, to help me with this, so I'm going to need you guys to help with this instead. Uh, it is time for the news. <laughs> Oh boy. So, uh, as I said, I went through Kickstarter today because I was like, well, I'm going to be solo on the cast. Like, I wonder, I wonder what's out there right now for solo games because um, I do actually like playing solo games too. Like, that is one thing over, over the course of the pandemic I actually discovered about myself is I was like, oh, I kind of like playing solo board games. Uh, who would ever have guessed the guy that likes sitting in his office painting tiny plastic figurines would also like uh, sitting by himself and playing board games. Hello, Supreze. Uh, but yeah, so I looked up what was on uh, Kickstarter today, and I actually found a bunch of really cool stuff. I'm I'm impressed with what's coming out. So the first one that I wanted to talk about here is Pulp Alley. Uh, this is definitely, definitely up my alley. So uh, those of you who've tuned in before know that uh, Beach Vacation Mando, Adam Grimm and I played in a campaign of... Um, Spirit of the Century that was set uh, basically in a pulp universe. Like we just took, well, Spirit of the Century is a pulp universe, period. Uh, we just pushed it up a little bit to the post-war era. Uh, this stuff, this this looks like it matches right in with that. So uh, things about China Station, allies, just seeing who all the starter, uh, both villains and protagonists are. Uh, like your protagonist is definitely, definitely not. Uh, it's the Dundee Scholars. It's definitely... Uh, definitely, definitely not Indiana Jones there. That that's impossible. Uh, but you also get like, you know, so we have our our stereotypical like Asian opponents. We have a uh, sort of sumo wrestler. We have, uh, and then we have a couple of like, basically, listen, we got Asian businessmen at the beginning of Temple of Doom. In this one, we just get like pan Asian bad guys. You know, our sky pirates. Uh, our mercenaries, at, at any rate, uh, yes, we have, you know, sort of East Asian, Middle Asian, or Middle Eastern, if you want to go with that. Uh, and then we have some Sky Pirates, which, again, uh, you guys have probably heard of my love for Sky Pirates, and I love the way these Sky Pirates look. So, like, everything about this, right up my alley, it is a one, uh, one to four player game. It looks just like a lot of fun. I like the minis. They're not like anything to write home about as far as like sculpting quality goes or anything, but like they're fun. They are exactly what I would want. So um, I really love the Danger Incorporated ones, which is why I had to come all the way down here because I love uh, weird like ray gun pop uh, robots and that robot is right up my alley. And then our two flyers, well actually, and also the Phantom Aces uh, flyer all of those pilots just look incredible to me so uh yeah you guys can head to the link in the description uh if you're watching this on youtube if you're on twitch you can head over to the youtube look at the description there it listen i, I, I can't make twitch links just show up uh i'm not that good at twitch yet or period uh okay that is news the first news the second Paperback Adventures. Uh, this is, again, a really fun-looking solo game, and actually it's a two-player game, so it is a solo or two-player game. Um, this takes me back to the age of Choose Your Own Adventure, except for with way more rules and better thought-out rules. It's not just, like, turn to a random page and have your finger on the page so that you can go back when you invariably get the bad ending and have to redo it all over again. Um, even as a kid, Choose Your Own Adventures used to bother me because there's, like, no way of knowing that you're about to die, but this looks way cooler than that. Uh, it does actually look like there's rules. It looks fun to me, and it also reminds me of paperbacks, like, of Choose Your Own Adventure paperback books. So I am super excited for this. Uh, I actually backed it this morning on my actual account, not on uh, the Trace Minis account, so uh, I am looking forward to playing this. I think it's going to be a fun, fun time. And then, of course, there's not a whole lot of miniatures, unfortunately, in the last one. So I had to go and find one that had the most minis in it. And uh, 
There's a Witcher game. I've known that this was going to be on Kickstarter for like months now because I talked to the right person when they were feeling talky. Uh, there's 14 days left in the Kickstarter for this. This is very much... Um, you know how Simon like or Cool Meeting or not used to do like ridiculous Kickstarters where it, even um oh boy, what's it called? The one that I didn't back and have no intention of getting into that has the weird looking monsters that everybody loves painting that I hate so much. Uh you are the survivors, you start off with lanterns, everybody's painted a flower knight, and I have no intention of ever painting one. That game. Uh these big projects where the only like Kickstarter add-ons are a thousand more miniatures that you may or may never, <laughs> you'll probably never paint. I found one. That's what The Witcher is. I knew it was going to be this before it even started. It's not, it's not exactly the sort of game that I would want to play, but it is, it does look fun. The sculpts, uh, sorry, the renders that are on here look great. They absolutely do. Uh, I love the aesthetic. It very much reminds me of the first three uh, video games. Uh, less so the, the series, but that's fine. Uh, I think that the Amazon series took a really interesting aesthetic to uh, making The Witcher come to life. So, And I, I love the series, so that's also there. Uh, but we are deep into add-ons territory. Uh, it's not quite Simon add-ons territory, but... We are, I think it's over like $3 million now. So we've unlocked, you know, horse on roof because. Because CD Projekt Red is officially backing this one, like, of course, they're making fun of themselves for it. So, um, but yeah, I, I don't. There's still 14 days left on this thing, and they have smashed basically every goal they had at the beginning of it. So I'm sure that it's just more and more minis that are taken directly out of the creative assets of the three Witcher games. So it should be really good. Uh, as far as from an aesthetic point, they look like they've got a good team on board, um, not just from CD Projekt Rise, but also from Go On Board. So um, again, it's it's mostly, or I guess I haven't mentioned this, it's mostly the Polish team. Like it is mostly the guys from CD Projekt Red in addition to uh, uh, Go On Board. So. It'll be interesting to see what this looks like when it gets uh, finished. I don't know who is actually going to be the uh, the producer as far as the, the minis go. Um, generally, in situations like this, they're going to hire out a factory to do the actual mini production. And that factory makes all the difference in the world with the quality of the minis because these are all renders. Like These aren't actual minis on the website. Um, and that's always the frustrating part about Kickstarter is a lot of Kickstarter is kickstarting the dies for all the minis. Like it is kickstarting the tool and die because that is an incredibly expensive process. Getting, uh, you know, cleaning up 3D assets from the video games and turning them into minis, not terribly hard. You need some specialized sculptors and stuff to do that. But it's like, again, it's not that difficult. Getting minis produced is by far the hardest part of this. And who knows? Who knows? News item number the fourth. Dominion comes out. Well, it doesn't come out. They're they're doing the announcement uh, for Age of Sigmar 3 box set. So I assume we're going to get to see some rules. I assume we're going to get to finally know what the Destruction Army is going to be. Uh, I only assume that the Destruction Army is going to be... Well, we talked about it a little bit last week, and we'll spend the entire rest of the day today probably speculating about it. But, uh, and and... Yeah, that is that is what this weekend is going to be. I'll talk a little bit in the news uh, or just in the segment. I'm going to switch back to the painting camera because I want to get back to painting this guy now that we're most of the way to dry. Um, yeah, why don't why don't we just get to that? Let's get back to painting. OK, we are we are here. We are painting uh, again. I'm using scale color of uh, I just sort of finished up with our Dubai Brown for now. Uh, so we're going to go back to the Araco. Uh, you'll see I swapped from my number two, and I accidentally pulled out my zero. I I'm just swapping over to number one. Uh, I use Windsor Newton Series Sevens because they are locally available and plentiful. Um, I have used other brushes, uh, like other good quality Kalinsky Sable brushes in my day. I don't know if these are the ones I like the most. They just happen to be the ones that are close by. <laughs> and I'm used to them. I don't know if that's a glowing endorsement or not. I don't think it's actually meant to be. Um, 
but let's start highlighting this hair. So the first thing that I'm going to do with all this hair is wherever it is bunched up. So uh, where it goes over the top of other braids, um, where there are, wherever the hair is bunched. What I mean is by bunched is like, I, I won't take my hat off and do it with my long, glorious locks, but wherever hair is bunched together, uh, you tend to get shine that develops. And it's just because there is so much light refracting around on hair when it is bunched together. So if you, you know, had a ponytail, if you've had like a hand a fistful of hair, even not on a human head, even not in ideal lighting conditions, where it is gathered, it tends to it tends to luster if it's healthy hair. Just an observation that I've had from being around, you know, human hair, my own and others. I know, I sometimes see people. Hasn't really been that way the last year, but um, where hair gathers, because there is so much light that reflects around, because healthy hair is extremely glossy, it is very, very, um, it's a very shiny surface, right? And because of all that light refracting around, it tends to give off a glow, even if it isn't directly exposed to high highlight. Like, it may not be the hottest part of a photo, but even in relative shadow, it will catch light that you wouldn't expect just because it is hair and because it is gathered together and because there is so much of it uh, and so much light reflects off in weird ways. It just ends up being that hair gathered together tends to have uh, a shiny surface somewhere on. And because I'm not rendering individual hairs, because I'm not painting in uh, the billions of hairs that would make up this luxurious, glorious beard, uh, I'm going to fake some of that. Um, mostly by in these gathered spots. We're going to just bring the color up, whether or not it is fully in sunlight or it is in shadow or in shaden or what have you. We're just going to work with the understanding that gathered hair gathers light, right? Does it get fully highlighted? No, we're not going to be taking uh, weird pits and shadows and stuff and putting them to uh, white, which is our, our highest highlight on this on this model, right? We're, we're not going to do that because that is not what we are trying to express. We are instead, instead trying to express that gathered hair because the crazy way that millions and millions of things gathered together work is going to cause a refraction and reflection and internal refraction within it that will eventually light that hair so that it looks more probably luminous than you would expect so how i'm treating this is there's basically two tubes so i am volumetrically highlighting the tubes. So as we the tubes come together at the top, there is a highlight in the middle there. I'm also paying more attention to the sides. So both sides where we are quote unquote getting to gathering points. Um, I am pulling pigment towards the middle, as you can see here. I'm just gonna try and keep it as on cam as we possibly can here. Um, for me, that's that's relatively a miracle. But we are pulling pigment towards the middle. And even though I am covering over some of that Dubai brown that we dropped so that we had the separation between these strands of hair, I'm okay with that. Because right now, we are just trying to create the sense of gathered hair. You'll notice that I'm not making texture in the gather yet. I'm not making... Uh, I'm not really doing anything other than volumetrically highlighting a cylinder. I am volumetrically highlighting this cascade as it comes down from his face, like this this straight section here. I am treating that as uh, as as if it were um, a rectangular prism. So again, I'm just I've decided that I want light to gather sort of here towards this, and then we'll come back and we'll shadow it where it's going underneath the beard there, um, where it is gathered. So up here near these like more pointy bits. And I know it sort of sounds right now you're like, well, isn't that just edge highlighting? And yeah, it kind of is, but it's not entirely. Um, 
because we're still using the volumes of the model. Like we're still using the fact that this is two cylinders coming down either side of his face. That is a big part of this. Sorry if I am repeating myself constantly, but I am also reminding myself of how I want to do these highlights because uh, even though I have painted other blonde hair on a model that looks nearly identical to this one, as you know, it's a Blood Bowl team. They all look pretty much identical. They got little differences, but like it's Blood Bowl. There's like three sculpts. So again, just creating where there is gathering points of light. We're doing that. Other than that, when we don't have volumes to, to highlight, like this, let's let's talk about his little beardy tassel after the gather here. After the gather here, we've basically got a bunch of like flat planar shapes that don't really make sense for hair, but they make sense for how you sculpt hair. With these, I am just where light would gather. So where we wouldn't have shadowed areas, I'm just coming in. On the light facing surfaces, I'm just dropping down more of a rubrocco. Again, if this were gathered in some way, so up towards the actual braid or the gather here itself, this, this jewel bit, cool. We will get that to be a little bit lighter than you would assume it would be. We still want separation between the jewelly bit that I didn't finish the non-metallic metal on last week and didn't come back to because instead I, I touched other things. I was, I was, man, I, I, I will show them on stream here in a minute. You can see them on, um, on my Instagram. Uh, it's not a great series of photos and they're not super well painted, but, uh, it was one of those, like I did this in a weekend because I wanted to not sit around doing nothing on a weekend. So, you know, I put like eight hours into four figs and got them off of the desk kind of a deal. Like that was the entire point of the exercise it was like, how, how quickly can I get these from not painted to sort of painted? The answer was about eight hours over two days of me mostly watching YouTube videos. Okay. So we're working our way again. So we've got one braid here. Like we've got sort of one cylinder that's got some more texture to it. So again, I'm going to pull it as if it is one volume, right? So we are pulling. We will, we will deal with the idea of the individual braids and stuff here in a minute. But first and foremost, I want to pull everything as if this were a cylinder. I'm pulling it towards the center of the volume, towards the top of the cylinder. Uh, with a good cylinder where I can show you that this works on cylinders. I need something that is semi-reflective. Okay, here we go. Water bottle. Um, nope, not water bottle. Here we go. Uh, matte varnish bottle. So as much as the matte varnish bottle itself is not matte, because you can see when it is exposed to light, cylinders always reflect off of the top of the surface the, or the, the part of the surface that is closest to the actual light recipient. So in this case, the two lamps that are in my room are reflecting off of the cylinder at the point closest between the cylinder and the, the in this case, the eye is replaced by camera. But so the light comes in, it bounces off and collect or and, and is reflected up. So you see these really, uh, they are in, 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 in a more natural lighting setting as opposed to two point lights. These would be... Um, they would go the full width or the full height, I guess, of this bottle. But that is what we're duplicating. So instead of having two light sources, let's say we only have one light source that sort of splits the difference for some reason because the sky, but it'll go the full distance up and down in a very predictable manner, uh, like in a very straight line all the way up and down. So that's what we're doing to this, right? So we're just gathering, even though we have gathered hair here, we are bringing the light and bringing the pigment towards the middle, the largest point of the volume, and we'll eventually, even though we have lots of other work to do as far as making sure that this has like in the gathers and all the rest of it, all that stuff happens. All that stuff happens in smaller and smaller details with, that's why we have, you know, um, excuse me, that's, that's why we have other highlight colors around and it's not just doing this with Rocco and more and more Gobi Brown. 
we will put the tension into the hair, like the gathering points into the hair. We will put the highlights from from ambient light into the hair. But we're going to start off by bringing the volume of the highlight together. And yes, there are micro volumes within this volume. There always are. This is like any other part of the model. Uh, you know, an arm is, an, is a cylinder or a series of cylinders connected, a bunch of connected tubes. It's like the internet. Um, but in this case, we are, we break up those with other highlight colors, not other highlight colors exclusively, but using other highlight colors. This is, we'll also use those highlight colors to create the texture of hair because right now we've got just like a very smooth, uh, weirdly lumpy lo bread, loaf of bread. It's probably closest to what that actually looks like right now. To me, at least, it looks like a nice, uh, like chala, chaka, chaka. You know, the loaves of woven bread that are for holidays I don't celebrate. Not even for holidays. They just come from uh, Jewish bakeries for the most part. Like that's the stereotypical New York thing, right? Is challah? That's what it is. It's challah bread. It comes from you know bakeries. Jewish bakeries in in New York. New York. Wow, I cannot talk most of the time. Um, but yeah. So again, we're just sort of gathering light to the middle of this. Kala, that is currently his uh, his braid. We will use our highlight colors to create larger differences and, and really emphasize the individual shapes. But for right now, we want to have that whole thing look like one cohesive mass, which is why we're doing the like, OK, we drag the highlights towards the middle so that we have one volume here and then we will separate the volume out from there. Same thing we want. With this guy, we wanted light that kind of went across his arm, it breaks her, and it gets picked up again on the jewel on the back of his hand. It is one line of color that goes all the way through. Again, on this arm, we have one line of color that goes all the way through, like a, one line of highlight that comes all the way across. It goes across all of the metals. It goes across everything. There is one line of light that goes all the way through the model, right? Yes, it is deformed because how plates and armor work, but that is essentially what I wanted. It was I wanted one tube of light that went all the way across it. It's not natural. It, it doesn't look like real life. It looks like mini painting, which is surprisingly different than real life. Uh, don't try and paint realistically. Or do, I don't care. Like, it's, it's up to you. But that's not kind of the style that I painted. I don't paint in a realist style. I paint in like a augmented reality what sells the mini and like what sells um the reality that i'm creating the hyper the 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 heightened reality and hyper color world uh hyper saturated world of miniature painting okay diatribe aside we're moving up in the world we're going to come to our first uh highlight color mojave white man i stopped talking about dominion i got like dirt roaded by myself this is how ridiculous it is having a conversation with me in real life by the way i dirt road any conversation um dominion yeah it's coming out on saturday i'm excited to see what is in aos uh 3.0 um i have high hopes for the game because i really like some of the design decisions from like a mechanic standpoint that i've seen come into the game in the last uh little while I am not an Age of Sigmar player. I am not an any uh, miniature game player. I'm a, I'm a painter. Uh, I, I I paint commissions for like local friends and stuff like that. And this is the part of the hobby that I love the most. <laughs> but I have recently started watching Age of Sigmar Coach. I've started paying more attention to the actual like, oh, how does this game play? Because that sort of informs the way that things. Uh, get painted and stuff and and the more i've been sort of like getting into not necessarily like the lore but like the function and mechanic of the game the more i've started to appreciate how that stuff sort of shapes armies too uh and, and shapes paint schemes and stuff and some of the things that i thought were extremely silly about the game may make a little bit more sense like when people ask me for weird things to be painted in places i'm like yeah okay whatever but I'll do it because you gave me money. 
Uh, and I'm starting to get closer and closer to, oh, no, like, there's a lore reason for these, or there's a mechanics reason for these. And that mechanics reasons uh, have got me interested. Uh, specifically, there are two armies. Uh, and they're not the last two armies to come out. They've actually come out uh, quite a while ago. Um, but the two armies that interest me the most. You can tell me how they're, like, at best, like, C-tier armies or c rank armies. I don't. I don't care. Uh, the armies that actually interest me the most right now are the Slaves of Darkness and um, Cities of Sigmar. And I think they're two sides of the same coin, and it's a really smart um, business decision slash uh, mechanics feeding business decisions. Decisions? I know that that sounds weird, but like, hang out with me for a second here. So... Uh, we've got a bunch of players that are have been in this for the long haul, right? Like, we have people who have been a part of this hobby longer than I have been alive. Not not a whole lot, but, like, I'm old. Uh, and there are guys who have been playing Games Workshop products longer than I have been alive. Not by a huge amount, but, like, enough. Um, and those dudes had these cool old armies, these Bretonians and like, whatever. Wood Elves, uh, you know, uh, what are they called? The, the... The variety of wandering tribes that were, you know, not in Azir and not, therefore, part of, like, Sigmar's grand plans kind of a deal. These armies still exist. There are people that have them, and we want people to play with them. Okay, so we re release Cities of Sigmar. It is a moderate success. It, it gives these guys the ability to keep playing the game that they love with the minis that they painted two decades ago. Cool, whatever, right? Like, you know, you can go out and buy your um, Steam Cannon or your Steam Tanks and your whatever else, right? And, and feel feel good about the game, right? Like, Like, the game hasn't left you behind, and that's that's cool. Uh, but the, the part of it that makes me excited uh, from a design perspective is that, and from an aesthetics perspective, I guess, um, they didn't just say like, okay, those models still exist because we want you to stop complaining and trying to make uh, whatever Mantic's solution to Age of Sigmar was, uh, that everybody played for a hot minute. Or something or other. I don't know. I picked up like one commission for it and dropped it because uh, I didn't realize what it was until too late. And I was like, oh, this is just a Horde Army game? Yeah, no. No, no, thank you. Um, oh, you want me to paint a thousand minis badly so that you can go to a tournament? No, no, no dice. No S.0. Um, At any rate, um, so yeah, the, it's cool that that was, and that was really where I thought that age, the the cities of Sigmar armies were. Like I, I honestly thought that that was like the the short and skinny of it because you know there's a Bretonian looking dude on the front of the the codex, and I, I hadn't really received any commissions for it. Like I, I hadn't had a whole lot of exposure with it. Then, as I said, I started watching these YouTube channels where they're like, no, this is like actually the deal behind it. And the deal behind it is, is that it's not just a, a means of keeping these players in the game and keeping them happy and keeping them from playing uh, war. Hmm? Want to say war something or other? No, the, 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 the cool thing about it was, is it was actually a way for... Um, people to uh, not only have those armies, but have those armies and get them to update. Like you could you could have your uh, Wood Elf army and have a, an update of rules to keep you in the game, you know, to keep you alive, to keep you going, to keep your pistol leaders going and all the rest of it. You know, whatever it was that your favorite thing was, your, your weird mages flying around on griffins and whatnot, all that stuff kept being a thing. But on top of that, we also got um, a better version of Allegiance rules, I think. 
Now, you were always able to take allies from within your Grand Alliance, right? Like, you were up to allowed in a 4,000 point game, I believe you were allowed to take uh, up to 400 points, points of an ally. The cool thing with age, or with Cities of Sigmar is you can do that, but on top of being able to take that uh, allegiance, that like 400 points worth of um, an allied uh, friendly, you could also add on to that, um, I believe it's a quarter in models of, like a quarter by unit count. Of your army could be made up of stormcast eternal so it's like sort of the base step of that and then since then with like um let's see with marathi with uh sorry i'm gonna forget uh broken realms marathi with uh the kaharana overlords stuff um we've added a bunch of new cities of sigmar where they are allowed to take alternate dudes along in the process so it's not just that you can take Stormcast Eternals. I mean, you were always able to take like Fire Slayers or uh, Dark Elves, right? But now we've got like KO in there. We've got um, Drakas. You can take the Sylvaneth with you. You can take whatever, right? Like we've got uh, City in the the Realm of uh, of Life. So we've got like alariel has got her City of Sigmar that she's supporting, right? Everybody's got some sort of inclusion now, like everybody in Grand Alliance ordered. Uh, and then they did the same thing with Slaves of Darkness. So the Slaves of Darkness armies can take all the Warcry, uh, like bird people and whatnot, right? They can take all these armies along with them as a part of their cultists, but they all have like individual cooler, specialer flavors. So it's not just like, uh, you can you can play those old models if you want, old man, but like get ready to have a million Sigmarines in your army. It's like, no, we actually acknowledge that there's like some cool lore-y stuff that we can throw in here along with this uh, concept of both the cities and uh, the Chaos Realms having like particular inhabitants or wanting a certain type of cultist to, to worship the individual chaos gods or the chaos gods united or trying to become the ever chosen right like all of those things like that i don't think were well explored in the rules for like good old-fashioned chaos knights right like your, your your typical old school uh knights of chaos or black knights or whatever you want to call them i don't honestly remember right now because i'm thinking about model um they now have a better system behind them i think i could call it uh for for inclusion into age of sigmar i want to call it a better system and, and you guys uh, let me know what you think I, I think that it is a very cool way of including those armies together like to uh include these new models and to give life without having to go back and like remake bretonians or remake whatever right just just my thoughts on it just just my thoughts on it So uh, what I've been doing as far as painting right now, I am using a combination of Mojave White and Araco. And as you guys can see, I'm using, basically I'm using hairstyle strokes. So um, again, these are just small, very fine strokes that I'm using to build up. And now we are getting away from the building towards the middle of the volume and instead of building the individual volumes on his face or on his beard, right? So um, these little strands of hair here on either side, the the middle part of it and then also to the tops and to the gathered tension points on his beard so this is this is two different areas right so yes i am going to the reflective points at the top of the beard but i'm also getting there by doing let's let's see how close i can get it get it to to focus up you know focus up there we go okay let's hold it right there Okay, so I am painting tiny little strokes. Let's see if we can still keep it on cam. So I'm painting tiny little strokes across not only the top of the beard. So this is the place in the beard where it would be reflecting light from our roughly overhead angle, but also where there are tension points in the beard. So like where this fold wraps over, it is creating a tension point in the hair. We are creating a gathering point in the hair. That is also getting this little like 
tiny little line effects put onto it. So yes, I'm coming across the sides of the hair like this, where there is a top that would be exposed to the sun, that we would be exposing to the overhead light source, and then also along this tension point. And they are all going in the same direction. All of these little highlights. And yeah, it's real small. And it probably doesn't make a difference. Because who's going to notice this at more than an inch away? Doesn't matter. I'm doing it anyway. Mini painter. I don't know. I like the effort. I love the effort. Um, we're also going to... Still with the... Or we're going to go back to... Um, so this is our puddle of surfactant here. Surfactant and water. So just in this case, it's uh, airbrush flow improver, water. I'm going to take a little bit of a Rocco and mix it into our little puddle. Just making a little puddle of it here. I'm going to, in the places where I know I have high highlights, I just want to give it a little drip. I've got too much of that um, Gobi Brown, or sorry, Dubai Brown accumulated, because I can see right now. I'm, I'm being really gentle about it, because... Being gentle around hair and making hair look soft is, is important. Um, we're going to continue to highlight here for a little bit, and then we'll work our way around to the ponytail. We'll probably do this tassel a little bit here in a second. Um, I'm just going to keep bringing up the highlight on top. So again, where I am getting the most light, we are giving it a highlight. Then into the tension points. So again, on the top of the braid, down the side, top of the braid where it's gathering the most light, across the tension point. And and this is, as I said, this is slightly differently than I've seen most people do. Hair on yield the internet. And yeah, I watch a lot of YouTube videos because. Normally, when people are telling you to highlight hair, they're talking about, okay, well, drag it across the, you know, uh, if it's GW, they're just telling you to highlight the tops of the hair, right? Um, or, sorry, the most raised hell. Uh, if they get beyond, like, dry brush the hair like a maniac, it, it, it's got to be really special hair. Um and again, with most of my mini painting compatriots, uh, they're doing good things with this stuff. Um, I would argue that the only part that they're really missing is that we want to have, we want to express the gathering, the tight gathering of hair on our miniatures, right? So like, as I said, where this, yes, we are gathering. So we have a light point there. Let me continue that light point across the other side. But where there is tension in the hair, where the hair is under pressure from being gathered, we're going to continue to pull those tiny, 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 tiny little dots and slashes. They're really, really small little streaks. We are pulling those together because we want to make uh, the impression of tightly bound hair, of hair that is bound together in these tight braids. I mean, this guy's going out to play football with murder. Uh, he's going to have his 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 braids tied tight because the last thing that you want is some enormous troll grabbing you by the loosened braids and using you as a whip to like hit your thrower with these dwarves don't have throwers but you can imagine that if they did uh that would be a pretty sound tactic you know you pick up the blocker by his beard and and swipe him off on uh the closest uh tactically important dude Sounds like a lot of tactics for a troll to get through his skull, but you know, there's there's a smart coach out there somewhere who could help him with it. All right. In the meantime, um, we will come back here and yeah, we'll give it. We'll give me like ten minutes or so. Uh, just the dogs are both wandering around, uh, looking like they need to go outside. So I'm gonna go take the dogs out. Um, when we come back, I'm gonna work a little bit more of this uh, Mojave White into our highlights. We're going to continue to sort of get down into our shadow colors. Uh, this is where we're not going to use the surfactant anymore because I need to actually bring this color in and make sure it's even and not just hiding in the recesses. So we'll, we'll work a little bit more on finishing up the beard here. Um, we'll probably finish up the beard, these little tassels, and then we'll get uh, the back of his hair done. So stay tuned for that. Uh, we'll be back at uh, 7.35 or so. 
Oh, uh, I'm about to show a slideshow of like some of my older minis and stuff that I've completed. If you would like your work to be shown in our slideshow, that's cool. Uh, I would love to feature you guys. So just head over to uh, Instagram or you can uh, email me just choice minis at gmail.com or you can DM me on Instagram just at choice minis. I'd love to feature your guys' stuff because I like to see what you guys are painting too. Um, at any rate, let's uh, let's leave you with that and we'll be back in uh, eight ish minutes. Reference.
What is up, everybody? I'm back. We are back. Everybody's back, aren't we? Working on our dwarf. Working on some blonde hair for our dwarf here. We were working on uh, sort of evening out some of those shadows. So now that we've got like some pretty defined shadows in that beard, we're going to come in and uh, smooth that out a little bit. Now that we've got some highlight-ish colors done, we're not all the way to our final highlight colors, but we're final highlight color, I guess. Uh, but, you know, we're going to get into it. Ooh, I forgot the <laughs> reactive top. Give me one second. <clears throat> How's everybody doing tonight? If you got any questions about what I'm painting, or you just want to make fun of me for endlessly droning on about things and interrupting my own train of thought constantly, uh, you're more than welcome to. All right. Palette cam reestablished. Also, if anybody, um, anybody watching happens to know how I can get my hands on like a 30 series graphics card, boy, howdy, uh, I would love it. I don't, I don't even care. It could be like a 3060 or a 3070 or like a 3060, uh, I don't know, like PI or whatever, like the, the newer series of 3060s are that have the, all the mining stuff deactivated on. I don't care. I'm not in it for Bitcoin mining. Um, I, I'm. I am in it for I need a new graphics card because <laughs> whenever I play that, whenever I do the swap scenes to the opener, uh, my computer just like, oh, it, it, it's so close to just straight up giving up. Like it, it is like now nah. um, I was talking a little bit before we went to break there uh, about what I sort of like about the new allies rules with the cities of Sigmar and with uh, Slaves of Darkness. And part of, I guess, what I like about those rules in particular is that it does change the flavor of the army, right? Um, cities of Sigmar doesn't have great, um, excuse me, it doesn't have great uh, relics and stuff for the armies themselves. Like they're, they're not overpowered or anything like they're not an s tier army but they're a decent army uh depending on the, like the sub faction that you take but having really different um mechanics for sub factions is really cool like i think that that is being able to change the flavor of what you're playing based off of the like sub faction rules is really neat to me um to make these shadows that we're putting it or that we have on here a little bit more believable what i'm doing is i'm coming back with a mixture of our Deep shadow colors. So this is uh, a combination of a Rocco and Gobi Brown. And just like I did for the highlights, we're now coming in with this shadow color. We're putting it into the, not necessarily the recesses, but coming out of those recesses. We're again coming in with tiny, fine little lines. And again, this is adding, it may not, it's never going to be apparent from like five feet away. Not 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 the point of what we're doing right now, but what it is, is we're adding visual interest. We're adding noise into these shadows so that there is still texture in the shadows. We're not just getting a blob of shadow. We are getting, you know, there are tiny little lines there now, right? Those tiny, tiny little lines are the differences between like individuals or clumps of hair that are now together because of the binding that is on them and because we have a braid here like this dude's got an awesome looking braid going. shadow because it adds not only visual interest and noise it also continues to build out our texture and so in these deeper more shadowed parts again we're doing this both where the hair tucks under. So where it's tucking under one part of the braid is tucking under the other part of the braid. I'm doing it there. I'm also doing the same thing on the shadowed side of the beard. So like on the underside of this big, uh, basically cylinder, this volume, we're doing the same thing. Um, on this bottom side, I might get a little bit more aggressive about this whole situation. Ooh, I do not like this track. We are, we are gonna skip this track I, I said it to surprise me and i do not like the surprise that it's chosen for me this is not this is not the type of ooh. how about we listen to some chill piano that's chill yeah 
Sorry, I use a music service that gets me fewer copyrights. Not no copyright uh, claims. Fewer copyright claims from YouTube. Uh, if you want to watch some of our older videos so you can watch how we've gotten to this point with this dwarf, you can watch our Project Never Fallen videos, which we have mostly completed. I, I'm going to say completed, but not finished. Um, our, our Dark Angel, uh, the first volume of Project Never Fallen is done, which is our reimagining of uh, the Warhammer universe, had the ruinous powers not... Uh, gotten anybody from the the space marines so what what would have happened if all 20 chapters had stayed true and loyal to the emperor had never fallen to the ruinous powers what what would the war or what would the legionis astartes uh, what would the imperium look like uh, we're starting off with the 20 first founding chapters of course um you know depending on the success of the series we might get into some of the successor chapters and other are there interesting things? Uh, I've already had somebody ask me about what would have happened to the Grey Knights, and the que the answer to that question is, I have no idea. Like, what would happen to the uh, Ordo Inquisitor, the, the Ordo Malice? Like, what about all these, like, specialized dudes? What would their part be to play in the, you know, Emperor's... The Emperor's still alive, Horus is the War Master, uh, future of the 40th millennia and and the answer is i don't know everything uh we're sort of making up lore as we go along and and that's one of the like wonderful things that i love doing these sorts of like reimagining projects about um is getting to explore you know like what does this alternate lore look like uh, we even with just our our uh dark angels chapter we we sort of started off from the point of well, I got this Judiciar model because I want to reimagine what the Fallen looked like if the Fallen were the only ones who actually fell to the Ruinous Powers. Like, if they were the only ones who ever fell to Chaos. You know. what? How does that affect the world? How does that change things for uh, the Dark Angels? How does that change things for the world in general of 40k? So, tiny little brush strokes. Um, just because... That is in the hair, rest to our models, not just out here. Bag on. I'm not going to follow that temptation every time, but like wash is is fine to a degree. It's not be metal slash heavier metal by an army of painters, right? It sort of takes all the choices out of uh, the model, like putting that sort of um, and all power to the Artistic put that into practice in their painting studio. We constantly consult each other on work or have a single uh, painter paint 10,000 models. But it is not everybody's style. It shouldn't have to be everybody's style. We shouldn't. There are other other ways to paint both uh, cinema painting channels. And goodness knows, it took me. Um, I'm not going for realism. I'm going for some sort of like heightened reality of cartoon universe, saturated colors and um out of scale details like this is this is what i like about painting minis as opposed to you know painting canvas or painting 2d or whatever else yeah it is sort of paint by numbers so it's a little bit less uh mindful the entire time but like the other part of it is that it does provide some some fun uh alternate stimulation uh, as far as like actual painting goes I don't know, like, I haven't done actual, like, 2D painting since I was in high school, so... Mm -hmm. Other than, like, digital painting, I I do a lot of graphics design stuff, and that's all... That's its own kettle of fish. Drawing... Drawing logos and corporate documents is not really art, uh, as much as I like to try and fool myself that it is uh, when I'm doing it, so that it actually gets done. It is, it is a very different artistic challenge, I guess, than um, painting minis or than painting real 2D art. I say real 2D art. That is, that is pretentious as hell. At any rate, uh, enough, enough slagging on G-dubs and, and, and uh, mini painting in general. I don't know. I really love this hobby. At any rate. So again, I'm just coming back in. This is a combination of Mojave White and Iraco. 
I don't know what the like ratio is. It's a ratio. I don't know. It is. There is more Mojave White than Araco at this point in time. I can tell you that for certain. Um, but I'm just again tiny little lines, and and the way that I am highlighting this hair, and this is, you know, if there was a secret sauce to how I like to do hair, it's that hair should have highlights on parts that would catch light. But it also, hair catches light differently than like skin or metal because it also gathers light where it is under tension. Just because you have like hundreds and thousands of little light catching bits that come together. And those hundreds and thousands of bits of thing that come together do also produce their own um, internally refractive light. I wish that there was a way I could demo this on stream. I'll I'll take some pictures or something at some point, or I'll, I'll find some pictures on the internet that demonstrate this. But where hair is gathered together, especially in like I'm gonna say like Western European, Northern European hair colors. So I'm talking about blonde and uh, it's it's bastardy cousin ginger hair. Um, Where that hair gathers together, it tends to create a lighter surface. Where it is under tension, it creates light just because there is so much of it gathered together and it is reflecting slash reflect, refracting light in a way that produces a more obvious light source than it would otherwise have. Okay, so we're getting pretty close to this beard. Um, you can see, uh, using the combination of Iraco and and... Mojave white, so I'm using an off white and and a uh, sort of uh, desaturated yellow has produced our more actual a better representation of blonde hair than I feel like a lot of the like more yellow uh, blondes that we see out there. Um, as an owner of white hair as a child. And by white, I mean, like, it was called blonde, but, like, shit was white. Um, blonde hair is not yellow. Just straight up. If you think that blonde hair is yellow, you need to just go on the internet, look for a little bit, be like, oh, no, this guy is probably the closest to yellow I would ever get with blonde hair. But we're in like a heightened universe as well. We're in a little bit more saturated universe. So I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good about this color choice just based off of this is the universe of minis uh, where things are a little bit. Reality is heightened. We'll put it that way. The, the reality of like. Blonde hair is that it is in a lot of cases, not this color for somebody who is like 300 years old like this dude is. I mean, I don't actually know how long Warhammer dwarves live for. Can't say I've ever looked that up. I, I just always assumed that they sort of like fit in with like the Tolkien-esque mythology where it was like not immortal, but definitely longer than people. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong about that. I, I honestly don't know. That is that is making me feel a little uh, incompetent here, but it's fine. I'm incompetent about many, many things. So again, uh, we'll get them a little bit closer just so you can see some of the, more of the detail. We still got a little bit of evening of the shadows and stuff to do, but um, you guys can start to see there is more texture than just a base coat and some, some edge highlights. We, we have some visual interest in our hair. There is some places where I want to even out colors and stuff a little bit more. But we are we are we are reasonably close here. We are in the realm of this isn't so bad. Which, if I can say anything, that is that is where I live. The realm of this ain't so bad. Um, but you can see using that style, and as I as sort of rotate this, I want to sort of demonstrate that it sort of has that internal internally hair-like characteristic now. So because we've added a whole bunch of visual noise to the, the braids in particular, and because we have where it is under tension, having not, it's, we didn't go all the way to the like Iraq or to the, sorry, to the Mojave white, but we did go higher than just straight up Iraqo or a shadow color. 
where it is under tension, you guys can see it coming out in the model, right? It comes out in the final process. And that's just something I noticed and wanted to bring to, to mini painting. Like it's, it's, this is a thing that I know as, as an observant human being, no more observant than the average human being. It's just that I'm looking at how to recreate things in minis constantly because as one does, right? Having a slightly larger work surface here, uh, just with the side of the beard as, as we get some color on there, you can see <clears throat> what exactly the width of strokes and stuff that I'm using. So I'll get I'll get nice and close to the camera. This one. Bring them up nice and close. Uh, I also tend to paint literally flat on uh, my work surface because I have shaky hands from the enormous amount of caffeine I ingest. So it's just one of those things that you guys can see just hopefully you can see it's coming across on camera just how small those strokes actually are or how fine those strokes actually are and that is the same width that i'm using all the way across the model uh, and this is how we are creating the hair like texture even if it's not immediately apparent right even if you don't necessarily see the individual strokes uh, from from a distance this is the sort of thing it adds even if you don't necessarily witness it from 40 feet away or whatever, or three feet away. This is the sort of thing that in a photo online or in a I don't want to I'm gonna jinx myself. In in high quality paint jobs, you won't necessarily be able to identify the detail that is giving you the there is a lot of detail on this model feelings right away unless you're like really training yourself to look for them but they are there they're present that is that is a part of the like discipline part of the hobby is these it's not just all smooth blends and and you know perfect color theory it is also the amount of microscopic detail and minute detail that comes into the model just through being attentive to the model itself. Philosophy, or at least I hope so. I don't know. Maybe nobody actually notices this stuff and I'm the only, I know I'm not the only nerd. I watch enough YouTube painting channels where people are like, ah, oh, man, I don't know why I gave us that voice. I am, I am a part of the audience that goes, oh man, I, I tried, here, here's a weird story. I tried looking through the uh, miniature painting open. This is being put on by, who, who is it right now? That Somebody save me or don't. Um, I tried looking through the entries because I wanted to go through and vote. I, I didn't actually enter anything into the contest because I'm a fraud and uh, I don't know. Just, I didn't want to enter anything. Kind of came up in a time where I didn't really have a project that I was like, this one will be an entry. Um, at any rate, oh man, it's making me feel bad that I don't remember whose contest it actually is. It is so poorly organized and there are so clearly like dozens and dozens of models that are entered into multiple categories that they are inappropriate for that I stopped even looking. Uh, it looks, it's bad luck for us community. Uh, if you are one of those people that entered into every single category in both uh, Masters and um, what is it, Masters and something else, I don't, I, honest, I don't remember. If you're one of those people, just why, why, why did you take something that was like fun because none of us have got to enter a mini painting competition in like a year other than online competitions why why would you take something that was meant to be like a gift to the community so that we could like come together and celebrate some of the stuff that we've gotten to do during covid and just make it about you in that way it's a not great thing to do at any rate uh, there are some really cool entries on there though so I'm I'm happy that we did get some good entries. I, I'm sorry that I didn't get to see everybody's uh, entries and that I didn't uh, do my civic duty and vote. 
um, as a part of the community, but like, man, I I feel bad for those guys who are going to have to like sort through it to see like because they are actually judging all that stuff, right? Like they are actually awarding bronze, silver, gold in all the categories and all the rest of it. Like I feel bad for that those guys are going to have to go through that mess because uh, people were being selfish and couldn't uh, be bothered to actually abide the rules. Like it's too bad because like it was a really nice thing that they did for the community, and then there are just people. It seems to be my theme for 2021. There are just people. Exasperated size. At any rate, uh, we moved along from our beard, because uh, I'll come back. I'm not I'm not done with that beard. That beard is close though. Like we are we are in a good spot. Beardy McBeard. I say that and then I look at a shadow and I'm like, that shadow is so wrong. That volume is incorrect. At any rate, um, so we're onto the tassel, and the tassel is going to have uh, again a different texture to it than what we had on our um, on either our loose hair. So the loose hair, uh, you guys saw that I did just little little strokes. Little strokey strokes on on the loose hairs here that don't go all the way through the beard. They're just you know he, gone here and gone kind of a deal, right? Like they are. As I continue to do them and then stop talking in the middle of the sentence because I'm concentrating about uh, brush placement. We're back into loose hair. And loose hair has a different texture than tightly woven or braided hair. So unlike before where we had uh, hair that is under tension, the only place that's under tension on this part of the model, like where the hair is rather under tension, is right up underneath of this jewel uh, or underneath this gather here, his, his little hair clip, little hair piece. So we'll give that some highlight. And we're not going to get rid of the deep shadow that comes from under there, but we are going to like give all of that hair a little bit of attention and give it some strands and give it give it again the idea of being under being under tension like the hair is gathered it is under tension it is it is scooped together so we give it a little bit more light than you would otherwise give it because that is the way that hair reacts under light under under gathering and this is also sort of uh, if you want to think about it this way, the difference between, uh, say, lady hair or, or traditionally female haircuts and, and dude hair. Dude hair in a lot of cases is just free, it's loose, it's flowing, it's doing its thing, it's not highly styled, it's not quaffed in it, it, for the most part. Y you'll get guys that have that, you'll get guys that have like oil slicked hair and all the rest of it, or oily texture to their hair. Um, highly, highly styled male hair tends to be very rigid. It tends to be, but it doesn't tend to be under tension except for in braiding. So where we have models that have braided hair, it tends to much more naturally mimic um, female hairstyles because a lot of female hairstyles include putting hair under tension. So whether it's being gathered into a ponytail or whether it's being you know, braided or what have you, hair tension is a part of their hairstyles, at least in, you know, like Western cultures. I'm not, not going to say everybody does that, but like, because uh, there's lots of hairstyles in, in, in many cultures that don't have tension that are both male and female. But I was to like rate them in a very stereotypical way. Female hairstyles tend to have more tension in them than male hairstyles do. Um, male hairstyles, if they're highly stylized, as I said, they tend towards the stiff and um, coiffed as opposed to the uh, under tension side of things. Again, probably being overly general, but like the difference between a pompadour and like uh, a set of ringlets, 
not that much or, or or it's a lot of product that gets you there right it is a very stiff hairstyle those are similar but like the difference between um a shoulder length of bob and well oh sorry the similarities in like female haircuts are like loose flowing hair so like hair that's not tied up that's not in a ponytail that's not in a bun all the rest of it like if uh padme amidala didn't use it as a hairstyle uh that's probably a looser hairstyle I'm going to use a Star Wars reference because I hope that most people can get the Star Wars reference in this one. Padme had lots of either tense hairstyles, so uh, styles that were braided or coiffed. Whereas, um, what's a good example in fiction of somebody who has a much looser hairstyle? Um, now I'm going to have to think for a minute. Generally, like in at least in Western art or in like North American art, uh, women tend to have uh, it tends to adopt the like more uh, either coiffed or under tension styles, unless it is explicitly meant to be um, sexualized. Like women letting their hair down is an oddly like sexual thing in most Western like literature and stuff. So, like, I think of the times where like women quote unquote let their hair down and it's oddly uh oversexed like everything in uh, not everything but like a lot of things uh in western civilization we have no idea how to deal with uh the he minor is maybe this is just me as a dude uh not able to deal with that sort of thing but i feel like it is uh, a part of our culture just period Okay, um, the other thing with hair is it is semi-translucent. So even though we are on the bottom of hair, uh, and this goes throughout the model, even though we're on the bottoms of hair, because I'm going to work on the bottom of this little hair tassel a little bit, um, the same sort of situation that we were talking about on the tops of the hair still applies. Um, hairs under tension still are more luminous than the hairs that surround them because now they are reflecting light off the ground, but they're still reflecting light. So you will never get hair that goes to like, unless the 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 person in question um, <clears throat> is in an absolutely black room with like absolutely black floors, in which case everything would be black. So I don't know why that would be an exception. But anyway, um, Uh, sorry. When we're in those situations, there is reflected light. So light comes back up off the ground. Um, and because it is semi-translucent, there is still an amount of light that travels through the material as well. Uh, so not only are we getting light traveling through the material that where we have gathering points and endpoints is going to become more luminous. So it also has to do with the volumes as well. So, for example where we get to the ends of these bits of hair, right? And you'll see that I did this on the front side. Hey, Silent Seth, thanks for the follow, man. Oh, thanks a lot, Sprinter Brush. For the raid. I, I have no idea how, how, uh, uh, um... Hey, thanks for the follow, Spastek. Um, I have no idea how Twitch works. I'm mostly a YouTube streamer, but, uh, yeah. Thank you, Sphere and Abarta25. Wow. All sorts of follows. Thanks a lot, guys. Um, talking about tassels on hair. So semi-translucent hair. Um, it's going to get color that comes in from the top. So it'll cut, get your main light source. So in this case, we have a basically Zenithal highlight on our little dwarfy friend here. And I'm Canadian. Aw, thanks, Splintered Brush. Getting me to 40, baby. Thanks a lot. Well, that'll get me, uh, yeah, it'll get me partway to my partnership. If you guys want to follow me or like and subscribe on YouTube, I would also really appreciate that so that I can actually get uh, my 100 on YouTube. Uh, we're close. I've got giveaways when we get to 100 on YouTube. I promise my followers over there. So you can follow my links. Uh, it's just uh, wlo.link slash at choice minis, and you can find me there too. Hey. For Chris Gaming, thank you very much for the follow. I'm going to miss some of you guys, and I apologize for that, but I will try as much as possible. 
to uh to to thank you all well thank you for the raid and also uh thanks everybody for the follows i really appreciate that um sorry we're getting light in from the top and because hair is semi-translucent we're gonna have some of that travel through and especially on the tips of the actual hair itself that is where the most light will come through so this is, should be reflected on both the top and the bottom of the miniature um again we're using tiny little brush strokes i'll try and make sure that this is on stream uh but we're trying to use tiny little brush strokes to simulate that. And this is where I'm just using Mojave White, right? Um, I can come back and blend this better into the actual like colors that surround the volumes in a second. But we're going to start off with just getting. There we go. Just getting. The tips of this hair. Thanks for the subscribe, Seth Grass. I know I haven't changed the default sounds on for my uh, for my Twitch stuff and Splinter Brush. Thanks a lot, man. I haven't actually gotten the sound set up on that side. Uh, I, sh I should like spend 10 minutes doing it. It's just work has been crazy right now. So um, now that we've got the bottom of that so that we've got that sort of translucent translucency. So I guess I can sort of sort of show this with my arm here. Uh, no, it's not going to work on this. I will find a photo of it at some point in time. We can talk about it then. The next time we do hair, we can talk about it. But towards the end of hair, uh, because it isn't as even as they sculpt it on these models, obviously, uh, it would be literally impossible to sculpt nice um, frayed edges to hair. We're going to instead sort of mimic that frayed edge by just running along the direction so there's obviously a directionality to the hair. We're just going to use that directionality that we got and give it nice little strokes. They don't all have to start or end in the same spot, but we're just using this highlight color, the Mojave white to, <clears throat> excuse me, to sort of demonstrate that sort of translucency. So we'll do it on the bottom here first, and then we'll come back in with some of our deeper colors. So we'll come back in with the Araco here in a minute. But again, we're just in the direction of the hair flow. So even on this, let's talk about this little one that's giving me issue right now. Because of the way that they sculpted this little tuft of hair right here. Let's make sure that actually, there we go. They've sculpted it not only so that it's flicking up, but because of the three dimensionality of the sculpt, it's also flicking back. So we're just going to follow along with it. Thank you, eat your face. Oh, I just got that. It's each. Uh, that's, that's clever. I like it. You got me to say eat your face. I like that. Thanks so much for the follows, guys. I'm really. I'm quite uh, pleasantly surprised. I am also way behind on chat. Fellow champagne cork user. Yeah, honestly, I use like a dozen different handles. Uh, I got Regress 360s. I've got Games Workshop handles and stuff around here. Streamlabs is aggressive with the blocks. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just one of those things. I, I, I like the champagne corks for certain models. I also like it more for sub assemblies. I'll be honest. That is probably where I like them the most. Uh, it's just that uh, I am out of other brush handles right now because, uh, yeah, that's 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 how I am right now. Okay, continuing along with our painting adventure. So now that we've got sort of established uh, the frayed edges there, to add more interest and noise into our model. I'm coming back in with our Araco, which is our major color for our blonde. Like this is our sort of base color, I guess you could call it our base coat and even all the way to the tips. So even though I spent a lot of time making the, the hair along the edge there, like getting it to white and getting it in fairly small strokes all the way. And it doesn't start there every time, but like I am starting there a lot of the time and just pulling back with the Araco to sort of blend this. I'm not doing smooth blends. I'm not coming in and like flooding in color or whatever. I'm just using the texture created by having tiny little brush strokes 
to break up that edge, right? And then we'll do it one more time here with our shadow colors. So this is, uh, in this case, we're using Dubai Brown. We're gonna use our shadow color. And one more time, we just drop in the shadow color. And again, this can come all the way to the tip if we want. Uh, hair doesn't fall evenly. It is not nearly as cool and as well structured as this guy's hair is. Or if it was, it would never move again because, well, we talked about how hair works uh, a couple of minutes ago. Um, but it's just one of those things that having the hair structured that way, like in a in a loose form like this, having his hair loosely held like this, like it is past past his little gather there. Um, hair falls in all sorts of weird and different ways. Like it doesn't fall in a predictable manner. So some of it is sticking out. Some of it is inside. And we're just sort of trying to mimic that with tiny little brush strokes. Now, in general, we already did our volumetric highlight, right? So we already have sort of the, the general volume of the model taken care of. But now we have, you know, and I'm just going back and forth at this point in time, keeping. So again, when I say I'm going back and forth, I'm going back to my highlight color to my Mojave white. And adding in little bits of texture again, because hair sticks out in weird ways, and especially when it's loose like this, it's going to stick out in even different ways. So because differenter is definitely a word. So what are you guys working on tonight? Thank you guys so much for the raids. Thank you, Orcus Gaming. Thank you very much to everybody who's uh, followed on the channel. I'm sorry if I missed you, Seth, uh, Orcus, uh, NG Luminous, Abarda24, Sphere, Spatek, Silent Seth, and that's I think I got everybody. Thank you guys so much for the follows. Thank you very much, Orcus Gaming. Hey friends. How you doing? What are you guys working on tonight? Are you I'm assuming you guys are painting along, or maybe you aren't. Maybe you're just here hanging out. As weird as that sounds, I, I get you. Uh I watch other people's streams to like just sort of relax and zone out too, so that I'm not painting my own stuff, because you know. Like I like watching other people's streams. Oh, yeah, I, I get you with the reassembly. So uh, just after I started the stream, I actually started up with um, I was going to stream this all. I got a Mac M1 to, to run the stream in specific because I I was tired of waiting for a 30 series graphics card. And I was like, I don't know if I want to chance it on my old nine. R9. Uh, yep, we're running this on an R AMD R9. Um, so I built everything in my office or sorry, in my yeah, in my other office uh, so that I would have all the streaming stuff set up. And I nearly lost my mind when I had to remove all my mini stuff for a second time in a month. Uh, I've moved it out of the basement to the office to do streaming and then had to remove everything so that I could use the uh, work PC to do this is my work desk and it's the like leather background and whatnot. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just about lost it. So reassembling that desk, I get you, man. It is. And on top of it, a move on top of that would just that's that's no fun. So again, we're just coming in and what I'm doing now is I'm reinforcing highlights on as, as we move towards uh, are actual like I'm going to get to pure white because I want this guy to have a nice silky beard. I'm reinforcing some of the highlights. So I've at this point in time, I am going for light catching places. I'm not going to go into the tension places. So even though there are places on the hair here where it is under tension at this point in time, I'm just going for the light catching directions because this is where we're really going to show off the shine of this guy's beautiful glorious blonde beard is just in those light catch areas so across the tops of these braids and again rather than highlighting across so uh, rather than highlighting by just swiping across i'm using tiny little strokes to make hair texture because 
even though I might have covered every other layer of paint that I've ever put on this mini by now by just adding Mojave White across it. Unless this is the direction of hair flow. So on these guys, it's the direction of hair flow it happens to coincide with where I need to put my highlights. But on this side, it is opposite where the highlights are actually going across the hair. In all those cases, stuff and things happens. Uh, no, I'm just... What we're doing is we are going with the direction of the hair and highlighting in the direction that the hair is traveling while keeping in mind our generally overhead light source. So we're just about done with our Mojave White. Uh, and I am also going to take the this part of the model as far as this part of his hair. Um, this beard is the major feature of this model, right? Like if I if I were to look at this model and say like, what is the thing that is coolest about this? Uh, this beard, right? Uh, on our orcs that we're working on on the other Blood Bowl team on our Orkland Raiders, it is their skin that's going to be their major feature. So I'm going to put more into that. Debating between starting a big project, I have assembled and primed an Abolith and Pal Antar, or do I want to keep it small? Actually. Um, Abolith, I did, um, not an Abolith, but something pretty close to it for, we're playing through, uh, I guess, I play D&D &D as well. Uh, spoiler alerts for uh, anybody who is playing through Tomb of Annihilation. I'm not the DM, but I do paint most of the minis for our group. Okay, all the minis for our group, because I'm that guy. Uh, but... There is a certain thing at the end of Tomb of Annihilation. I now I don't want to spoil this like D and D module that has been out for like years. At any rate, I painted the thing from the end of it, and in the same style of like an Abolith having something that is uh, uh, like a cosmic horror, uh, it was surprisingly fast. Still detailed. Uh, I can grab it out here in a second and talk about it a little bit just while I'm. Thinking about it, yeah. Well, remind me sometime. Uh, each face, and I'll, I'll pull it out. But it is one of those things that, especially with um, with those cosmic horror things, because it is sort of like a slimy, unknown weirdo. You can get away a little bit with some sneaky techniques to sort of finish them off faster that actually add to that sort of like alien horror element of them. And it uh, lets you get away a little bit faster, a little bit cleaner. You don't have to. It's not like uh, I'm not talking about like a Sarah Rack who's on the front of the book who I used uh, the Nagash model. I, I customized the Nagash model a little bit and we're using him as a Sarah Rack in that campaign. Uh, Nagash is still not done. I've had that model now for like three years that we've been playing the campaign. I mean, hope it didn't help how long this campaign is taking, but like it's been three years that we've been playing it. I still don't have Nagash done because big models and I, we get along sometimes, but like not all the time. That's for sure. There are definitely times in my life where I'm like, no, no, no large models. So. OK, out onto the palette now, you can see I, I've got a little dot this is just pure white. So I'm going to take that and mix it into our Mojave white. Uh, it is scale color white, so it's not particularly powerful. If I wanted a powerful white, I'd go and find the tube of uh, heavy body acrylic. In this case, what I'm doing now is I am literally just dropping very high highlights. So I'm not even necessarily I might be moving the brush like a tiny amount as I'm doing this. But this is where my real hot highlights are going to come in is with this sort of mixed white and Mojave white. This is going to be where I put the little glints of extra, extra special sauce to really sell the fact that he's got a silky beard. Because this guy looks like he's got a silky beard, right? Like, he looks like he uses conditioner. I mean, with a beard like this, he's got to be using conditioner. My hair is nowhere near this long, and I use conditioner, so... Gotta gotta think that this guy would be using whatever the medieval uh Warhammer Warhammer the old world uh murder football equivalent of conditioner is. It's gotta be something, right?
Also, I do like painting uh, plantar skin. Plantar skin. I, I'm never quite sure on that word. Uh, but like... Non-human skin tones are fun. I mean, human skin tones are fun too, but like non-human skin tones are kind of my jam. Uh, if you follow me on Insta, this was the weekend's project was... Um, I did the entire warband for... Or not warband, the entire under... under underworld uh, band. I wanted to see if I could get it done in about 12 hours of painting, and uh, I did. I got four minis done in 12 hours of painting, which is not normal for me, uh, unless I'm on the clock. When they're personal models, uh, I will spend forever on them, because that's who I am as a person. Uh, there's no... There's no real time limits, right? When you're having fun, you can just keep painting. You always find something else that you'd like to update just a little bit more. So again, putting that sort of magic sauce, that just final glints. And again, this doesn't have to be perfectly even. Even though I'm using tiny little touches, I still want to maintain the idea that this is hair. It has texture to it, right? It is flow to how it works. We want to make sure that that flow comes out and that we got that silky, silky smoothness in this dude's beard. So we're done right now. And I'll throw him on the Instagram. Uh, I'll, I'll throw it up in my story after we're done tonight. Uh, if you want to follow me on Instagram, uh, it's just Choice Minis. Same as the channel. Uh, without the Z, I guess. I have the non-Z channel on, on Twitch as well. Uh, on YouTube, you guys know what I'm talking about. But on Twitch... Um, I may have accidentally lost control of an, the email account that is registered to uh, Choice Minis with an S. So I need to have my 40 followers so I can get my channel back. Uh, or at least change both the aliases so that I can get my channel back. Because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fraud. I'm a hack. At any rate. Do I want to see? Oh, sorry, I totally missed that, Francis. Uh, do you want to see what? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'd love to see what your friend did to your army. Awesome. Sorry, I'm just looking further up in chat. Obviously, I missed some stuff. Uh, just received my Tomb Kings. I'm assuming that you eBayed some Tomb Kings, or did you actually get like somebody to model you some? Because uh, I missed Tomb Kings so much that I painted two Indominus boxes of Necrons. That's how much I miss the Tomb Kings. I miss the Tomb Kings so much it hurts sometimes. Also, I haven't found anybody who has done a satisfactory... If I want to do Tomb Kings, I want it to be like new GW Skellies, not the Soulbite Gravelord Skellies. Uh, I'm talking about the Underworld... You know that like first box of Underworld uh, uh, Skellies that came, I'm going to forget the name of the, the Sepulchral Guard, those Skellies. I want those with big old uh, Egyptian style shields, like big old Tomb King shields. That's what I want. If somebody can model those, I will, I will gladly hit up whatever Kickstarter, GoFundMe, uh, pay per download, whatever you want. Uh, I would definitely paint that army. That that seems like that seems like a good time. Will I do it on commission? No, because I don't paint armies on commission. I I hate myself a lot, but not quite that much. That's that's a joke. I don't actually hate myself, but like I like taking character commissions. If anybody is ever interested, I like doing character commissions. I like doing diorama commissions. I do not. I do not do army commissions. I I've done it twice and both times. Uh, I won't don't want to say friendship ending, but like I don't. I don't specifically wish the 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 commission the commissioner harm. Commission, yeah, I guess it would be the commissioner harm. Um, any specific harm, I guess. Uh, but I I learned something about myself, and that is, no matter how much money they are promising. I don't want that. I don't want that money. I am privileged enough that I do not need that money.
So uh, again, we're just into Mojave White and uh, Iraku as we come around to the back of the hair. So the hair on the back side of it here, or on the back side of our dude here, is in a little bit of a different orientation. So like the the flat plate, plate, plate uh, means that all the hair is going to be traveling towards the inside. So it's all going to be wrapping around and under. In cases like this, I'm going to be pretty cautious to make sure that we've got hair going in the right direction, at the very least. But it also means that on my highlight stuff, because it is now long, thin shapes that I'm trying to duplicate, we're going to be a little bit, we're going to have to be pretty careful that we're not covering all of the model like all of the, the individual shapes, we're going to keep some separation. So we don't get to do necessarily as many strokes to make those highlights happen. But we also... Because if I overpopulate, like if I if I hit it with 10,000 tiny little strokes, uh, it's not going to look like hair anymore. It's just going to look like I did a real bad job of like blending. Also, the hair on this part of the model, not as well sculpted. It's still okay but not, not as well sculpted. So again, I'll try and keep it on stream for you guys. Just gonna... Nice, thin little strokes. Keeping it to where the hair is under tension. Or where it is gathering light, so... On this part of the model, on this very upper part of the model, I'm I'm a little bit more okay with it catching more light, with it being a little bit lighter than what it was on the beard. But we'll still work back and forth, right? So I'm still coming back with my Rocco. I'm still knocking down the parts of it that I think too much Mojave White. On the tensioned parts of the hair, so parts where it is ducking other ducking under other parts of the hair is an example of tensed hair. Uh, I've explained this a couple times now, but I'll, I'll go through it one more time because I, I never know when people are hopping in and out, right? Um, hair that is under tension, hair that is gathered, has an internal refraction that uh, causes it to look lighter than it would otherwise be. So what I mean when, hair, when I say hair under tension is like hair that is gathered into a bun, or in this case, on this guy's braid, um, places where it is tensed up against other hairs. Because hair is semi-translucent, um, when you gather it all up together, like when you when you squeeze it together in a braid or in like a gather or stuff like that, you tend to get light in that position that you wouldn't otherwise see. Now, it's not like that it's glowing or anything, like it's not significantly brighter than like the world that surrounds it, but it is enough brighter that we need to actually articulate that in the model for it to look like reasonable hair. If we just ignore it and be like, eh, whatever, like, hair's hair, man. That's cool. You can totally do that. That is absolutely the way that you should paint minis. <laughs> like, if, if the goal is to get it on the tabletop, just ignore this. Like, get it on the tabletop. Put three colors on and go. But if you're trying to express something, like, with the artistic intent behind it, hair that is gathered, so we can look on our example on the beard, where it's, hair is gathered where it is tightly wound, we have much higher highlights than what we do in areas where it's loose. Uh, not to say that it doesn't have highlights in the areas where it's loose, but they tend to gather in different places. That's where light is filtering through the hair because the hair is thinning out. That's where we get light. In these cases, we have hair that is tightly wrapped together. So you can see like on the tops of these little like areas in his beard, we have put more highlight there than what would otherwise be really there because that hair is almost 90 degrees. Like when we look at it from above, yeah, these first couple of, of, of braids, yeah, they have light reflectivity from the sun coming down on them or our overhead light source. But you look down further on the model and I still have quite a bit of light happening there, right? And that, that light is because of the hair being under tension and hair light filtering through hair. Cause again, hair semi-transparent. I feel like I'm a broken record. You guys can tell me to, uh, to quit it. If I am, if I am on stuff too much. My puppies are playing somewhere in the house. I've got 
two super cute Shiba Inus. Uh, they are half brother and sister. The youngest one, Apollo, who's a baby boy, is six months old, and his older sister, Apollo, is two. So they are both still very much in everything is play mode. Um, very much playful little doges. So they're doing their thing. I apologize if it comes through on stream. Uh, I don't know. Dogs are great. Not to say that cats aren't okay. But, like, dogs are great. So if you don't like the dogs making noise, I guess, like, that's cool. We can do that. We'll have to fight about it later. But, like, for right now, I accept you and your opinions. So again, so because this area of the plate, like of this plated braid is up towards the top of his head, I am going to in general have more of this trending towards this like Mojave white and Iraqo mix. But we're also going to drop this down quite a bit further. Again, I am going to work the volumetric highlight on this area first. So as much as I was, I got a little ahead of myself there. I'm not going to lie to you guys. I got a little ahead of myself. I started doing these individual brush strokes. And you know what I hadn't completed? I hadn't completed my volumetric. So, because again, this is a cylinder. Cylinders make highlights down the middle of the cylinder or the part of the cylinder that is closest to the actual light source. So we're just, again, going through and making this volumetrically make sense. So the area that is closest to the, uh, to the, the sun in this case, or our overhead light source, because I'm not entirely certain whether these guys are going to be playing indoor ball or outdoor ball. I know from lore that they are probably playing outdoor ball, but like, I don't care. It's my mini. Maybe they're playing indoor. Maybe they got a big upgrade. Maybe they're playing underground under giant magical lights. Not good at lore. Anyway, we're going to do the volumetric highlight so that we've got the general volume speaking to that volumetric highlight first. Then we're going to come back and we're going to do the actual like messy task of making sure that this all makes sense, not just in a volumetric sense, but also in the sense of uh, our overall or, or making sure the textures make sense in that volumetric. So coming out to these spindly bits here, let's just get these started. Uh, this is a Again, a combination of Mojave White. I'm using all scale color, by the way. At least right now, I'm using all scale color. Uh, we're using a combination of Mojave White and Araco. We get that done. Get that on there. Um, and especially with these tassels, just like we were talking about down on the bottom here, where hair is free and, and loose, more light is going to shine through it just because there is a dispersion of light uh, or a dispersion of the hairs like the hair becomes less dense. So more light travels through it. So it's going to look a slightly lighter. Um, let's work a little bit on making sure that we got some shapes, even though this part of the sculpt is probably the worst part of the sculpt in the entire model. Uh, the underside of this hair is uh, suffers from uh, the sculptor forgot about it. So it's just sort of a big old like poorly defined blob. So we're going to do some work on it to make it a less poorly defined blob. Some might even say not a poorly defined blob. They would be incorrect. It is still a poorly defined blob, but we're going to give our poorly defined blob a little bit better shape. So uh, this definitely suffers from GW box game syndrome, uh, at least until the last few GW box games. And I'm talking about like um, well, actually, most of are modern box games. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Blackstone Fortress, uh, Silver Tower, Cursed City, briefly, before it was no longer a box game because it was a limited edition game. I'm never going to let GW live that one down as long as I live. Um, back in ye olde days of uh, just Blood Bowl and, oh, basically all of the old games, uh, GW used to make really good primary facings to their models. And then just sort of gave up after that. Uh, and this was actually, with the exception of like 40k, a pretty common thing for their modelers to do uh, all the way through the line until 
fairly recently, actually. Um, basically, when they swapped over to entirely 3D modeling, uh, because you could just move the model around and, and look at it, uh, you didn't have to, like, figuring this out, if I was to actually model what the back part of these braids would look like, would I'd have to bring in a model. Like, I'd have to bring it, if I was trying to do it, I would have to bring in a model to sit for me and be like, so what does the underside of your hair look like when we hang it up like this? Because I wouldn't know either. But that was a fairly common occurrence in all modeling. Uh, even if you look at uh, the old, my personal favorite is going back and looking at like old Reaper stuff now and being like, oh my God, we thought these were cool. Uh, and I'm talking about like the pewter Reaper stuff, not like the new stuff that's been through like the Bones Kickstarters and whatnot. That stuff looks great. It's it's. I'm talking about like old school, like uh, less than sixty thousand series from 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 Reaper. That stuff was was rough. It was. Can we hide this under a cape? Then this man is wearing a cape. Oh man, that that part of the cape looks bad. He is wearing two capes now. This solution. There was no. No, no problem in a Reaper Mini that could not be solved by putting a cape or a pouch on it. At least the old ones. I actually, um, I picked up a bunch of Reaper Minis to do, uh, we were running a one shot, or I was running a one shot in D&D, and I picked up just a bunch of, like, merfolk and stuff, because we wanted to do, like, an underwater adventure. And they sent me a bunch of the Black Series stuff because I ordered like $400 worth of minis because it wasn't just like one game. It was... Okay, when I say I ordered a bunch of merfolk, I mean like I ordered merfolk and sharks and like octopuses and like coral reefs and like sunken treasure. And... Listen, I ordered every model that was labeled underground. So they sent me a bunch of the, the, the Black Series stuff and not just like the the black series of the month stuff there's like a bunch of black series stuff uh that they sent me at the same time um they're not sponsors of the channel cuz like i have like nine followers uh at any rate i feel like it, i just need to do that disclosure but anyway um when they sent me all that stuff uh they sent me like i, I believe it was called the ogre, ogre chieftain i think was the model that one of the models that they came along with that and oh man uh, sorry, it was an orc chieftain. That's what it was. Uh, oh man, that black series stuff is great. Like they 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 have smoothly transitioned out of uh, ye olde two thousands models uh, and into something much much better. I tend to be frustrated by bones unless I am doing like a ten minute you know like zenithal and a couple of coats of ink on it. I tend to get frustrated fairly quickly by bones models just because of how soft they are and how soft in detail they are but uh yeah I, that black series stuff i don't know do you are you guys you mentioned it ableth so i i can only assume it's either whiz kids or uh whiz kids or reaper i think that whiz kids is also getting new plastic so oh no they're not getting new plastics they're getting um pre-painted stuff that does not hold much interest to me for some reason. I can't tell what it is as I put my like seventh hour into this mini and only have, you know, armor 80% and hair. And we're not doing bad on here. And some NNM, NMM uh, gold on him. Again, for the most part with this model and, and with his brethren, uh, there are others of his kind. This, this just happens to be the example model. Most of them are in this sort of shape. They're just sitting on my other desk because, again, work desk. Um, I get them to about 80%. We're at about 80% on the front beard. We're, we're, we're not quite there on the back. I'm getting a little bit heavy uh, just with application. But with, uh, with this stuff, I get about 80% of the way there. And then I'm going to hold off on doing the final 10% to the model. Like, we're not going to... We're not going to take these guys to done because uh, they have to live in in a, in a lighting condition. This is an armies on parade uh, entry that I'm working on. Armies on parade 2022. Uh, it's either going to be these guys or the Orkland Raiders that go. Uh, I'm a, 
again, assuming or hoping that Games Workshop is actually going to do it uh, this year. I'd really love to uh, enter. Uh, I'd love to travel. This is one of the one of the parts of the hobby that I really love and miss is is being able to travel to competitions. I haven't done uh, a major single single figure uh, competition because uh, I just don't think I'm there. But uh, I also like building terrain, and I'm pretty good at it. So it's one of those things that we haven't really gotten to the terrain building parts of this yet because I wanted to get through sort of making the models and then we can occasionally throw in a terrain building stream it's really hard to live stream building terrain unless it is small terrain when i'm working on you know like a 23 by 32 board uh, it's going to be interesting i'll probably do details on stream but this is why we also have a youtube channel so that i can uh do the youtube thing where i can actually produce videos so that's that's something to look forward to in the future is actual mini terrain, mini diorama uh, tutorials. Again, if you uh, like what we're doing on stream here, I do have a YouTube backlog. Just I started off streaming on YouTube, and now I stream on both YouTube and Twitch. So if you happen to be following me on Twitch or on one or the other, uh, you can always cross streams or go over and watch all the VODs on YouTube, if you like, we're just choice games, I believe, on YouTube, or it'll, it'll come up under choice minis as well. Like it, it actually comes up under both on YouTube. Uh, just because choice games is also the gaming company that uh, I sort of uh, I sort of started off with. Uh, we we did some some one page dungeons and stuff that we that we have since sold the entire collection of so. That was a while back. Uh, I'm just going through right now and selectively reinforcing the shadows. So what I actually have on the palette there is a combination of flow improver uh, and and I just mixed it into our excuse me, mixed it into our do I brown uh, just because I want to bring some of the richness back into this hair. I was feeling a little washed on the back, so and wasn't quite happy with where we were, so give it a thin glaze of this flow improved uh this is the thing with with doing it this way with the dubai brown and the flow improver is it will settle heavily into the shadows which normally fine i just want to watch it for pooling is is the big part of it right now it will pool pretty heavily and it will leave nice stains if i just leave it alone so i'm gonna keep putzing with it i'm also gonna just while we're at it, uh, not really wet blend, but sort of wet blend a little bit of our mid-tone into some of the places that I think are a little hot right now. Just with that flow improver on it, uh, flow improver dries quite a bit slower than just straight up water and acrylic paint. So while it's on there and I got the chance, I'm going to take that chance. You always got to take that chance. I mean, you don't always have to, but like, life's more fun when you do. How are we feeling, ladies and gentlemen? Is that beard looking sufficiently silky? Let's get let's get a better shot. I know the the non-metallic molds or non-metallic mold non-metallic golds looking a little crusty up around the uh, up around the face. That's fine. We know we knew it's crusty right now. As I said, we're at about eighty percent. We'll wait for that to dry up and uh, we'll, we'll go at it again because I think I want to add. Just I'm looking at perspectives as I'm holding this guy and I want to add a little bit more of a highlight just along this edge. The hair, I know typically it doesn't make sense like Zenithal highlighting means that I get light from the top down, right? But just looking at the model. So if we if we put it into the camera in the same perspective that I'm looking at it right now, it looks a little dull. Like that, that braid doesn't really show up to me as being that nice silky, silky beard that we've established on the front. And we know that this guy conditions, right? So let's bring that around. Let's 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 bring that to the side of the model. Let's 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 balance off that hair so that it looks like he's got that lustrous, lustrous silkiness.
as sad as it sounds, I've been like frustratingly searching for some sort of pun to do with his conditioner condition. Con Still don't have it. This is clearly why I can't be a father. I, I cannot come up with dad jokes on demand. I don't have that like pun gene where it just like kicks in all of a sudden. Maybe if I was to procreate, it would kick in, but like that seems like a poor reason to procreate just to see whether or not like the ability to make dad jokes shows up. When I, uh, no. Nope. Accidentally spawn children. All right. So again, I don't necessarily need this to show up on that top perspective, but I do want it to show up from this front, right? I'm, I'm liking this, this sort of front three quarter that I've got going on here. So again, if this is an angle that I like, and it is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play into it. I'm gonna play this up, not because it's a good idea, but because it makes me feel happy. Listen, this isn't how light would fall across the model, and I don't care about realism. Realism in miniature painting is fine. That is that is an aesthetic that like a lot of dudes do really, really cool work in. It's not the space that I live in. I do not live in the realism space. I live in my like fun kind of cartoony reality. Because I scale is a mess on minis. Like this guy's hands are bigger than his head. That ain't a thing. So we just sort of ignore these things and we add more saturation than there would be in real life. And we add heightened drama with more, more contrast, more paint, more, more the good things so that we can, you know, see these guys. I mean, like, heck, if this guy goes to army is on parade, which it's, it's down to between these guys and the Oakland Raiders which is my, my Orc Blood Bowl team that I'm also painting on this channel. You guys can tune in for them next Thursday at 6 o'clock p.m. I promise I actually will do it next Thursday. This, this Thursday I kind of blew it off because they're sitting here on my desk and I was mad at them because I was doing some test painting and that prompted me to give up entirely on them for a bit and, uh, and paint that war band instead this weekend. But neither here nor there. Um... They will be back next Thursday, 6 o'clock p.m. Mountain Time. That's 5 o'clock uh, in the the Pacific Time Zone or 8 o'clock in Eastern Time. Uh, we'll be back with the Orkland Raiders. We're back on Tuesday with our uh, Project Never Fallen. So Project Never Fallen uh, is what if nobody had fallen to the Ruinous Powers? That's, that's literally that is the short pitch of it. It's 40K. We do little dioramas. Uh, I can show you. I haven't gotten him finished up, otherwise he would definitely already be on the grams. But uh, this was our first volume of Project Never Fallen, if, if I could get him to focus up. Come on, camera. Focus up now. Okay, you can, you can sort of see him. Uh, this is our first entry into Project Never Fallen, other than our, our firstborn has lost his uh, backpack, because I don't even think it was glued on there. I think it was just poster tacked. Um, yeah, this was our... Our first sort of chapter we did we did we wanted to have representatives from all of the chapters we have our little fallen guy here who has fallen to the ruinous powers because if they're dark angels they gotta have fallen like otherwise it just are they even dark angels if they don't have the fallen uh and we painted up a uh, primaris judiciary as an executioner uh we gave him a little bit of a uh meteorite blade uh because that was some of the lore that we came across while we were all talking about how we wanted to paint him on stream but yeah, I guess I should actually glue that on there. But that is our little diorama. It's it is just it was fun. I I, I really had fun making this guy up. So uh, I got a little bit of work to do. Obviously, just finishing off the uh, the the basing here. Uh, it's a little bit of work with oils, so I've been sort of ignoring it because I don't want to put on the respirator while it's like thirty degrees Celsius in my house. Um, but yeah, so uh, he is. Just about ready to go, and as soon as he's done, put him on the grams. Uh, next week we start the second volume. Started the process of. I mean, how could he not? Like we that if the fallen exist, 
again, other bits of lore we found out. Well, so we uh, have a fabulous file. I have some other chits. No, the Emperor's Children uh, are start is we're going to be back. Uh, I am. It is Thursday with our Orkland Raiders armor because uh, Raiders because I got. That's on Tuesday. He's a co-host and as much a part of the stream as I am. On Instagram, catching up his or like incredibly slow progress. It installed today, so he uh, painted together, which we haven't done in a year. We're gonna play D and D. Oh man, it's 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 just gonna be super duper. I I I am very excited for that. Otherwise, if you want to support the channel, I, the best thing you could possibly do to support uh, this channel is tell your friends about us. Uh, other people in the community, I I cannot thank you guys enough for the raid tonight. I really I cannot thank you guys enough for the raid tonight. Uh, we uh, we did it. I think I hit my 40 tonight, so hopefully we did. Um, if you want uh, to support us in other ways, you can pick up gear for the Oakland Raiders. You can pick up gears for these guys right here, the New Helm Guard Giants. You can pick up their gear on our website. It's just choiceminis.ca. Uh, if you want to follow me on Instagram, you can follow me. I am at choiceminis. In case we didn't figure it out yet, I am basically shutting down the stream here in a couple of minutes. Just, we're, we're there. Like, I wanted to get some blonde hair painted tonight. He's got some blonde hair. There's still a little bit of detail to finish up just around the end here, but that's more or less uh, just... I got a little bit heavy with the wash or with the with the with the glazing there. So we've got a little bit of a deposit there. Otherwise, it's just a matter of getting this stuff to the same sort of texture and, and highlight level that we got on the ends of this little flip up here. Same deal is going to happen over here. Um, yeah. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Uh, this would be normally where I say I love you, man, to Adam. And, and I do love him. I love you guys as well. Thank you guys so much for, for being here tonight. Um, get the vaccine. Do something about white supremacy. A cab. We'll see you guys on Thursday. Oh, on Tuesday. It's Thursday today. Wow. All right. We'll see you guys soon. What are chaos space points? How much, like, how many points? Or, like, what? 13? I don't know because I never played them. Choice minis. Want to play Grey Knights and Thousands of?